Today we're going to take a deep look at what scripture and history have to say about our generation, which is the generation of Christ's return. This is the timeline to the end. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is the Dance of Life podcast, and I'm your host, as always, Tudor Alexander. Thanks so much for being with me today. I always say that my episodes are important, but I honestly tell you that this episode will probably be one of the most important that I will ever record. Of course, who knows what's on the horizon, but ultimately, so far in all of the things that I've ever recorded, this episode will be one of the most important because of the topic matter at hand. We are at the end of the end in our generation, and understanding very clearly what to expect, what to watch in the news, what not to watch, and what not to be deceived by, I think these things are incredibly important. Because again, we are in the generation of the Lord's return. Now today will be a very special episode because we're going to look at a lot of things. We're going to take a bird's eye view. We're going to integrate a lot of things that I've already talked about. So another unique thing about this episode is that normally I try to do my best to make episodes, um, you know, stand alone, basically, so that you don't have to have a lot of context to learn. That's my goal with everything, because I really want to touch people who are beginners and, and who maybe don't know, or maybe they've been deceived on certain topics. And so I, I try to make everything stand alone. Nevertheless, this will be a bit of an exception. So this episode is going to integrate a lot of things that I've talked about in other places, like my end time series. Specifically, in the end time series, the episode on the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven churches. So all those things are going to come into play. We're going to look at the end times prophetic timeline that I created for my end time series. If you don't know what that is, that's just a resource. It's a you'll we'll look at it in this episode, but it's a very handy graphical resource to outline all of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation on one timeline. So that you can see visually where you are in history, which is really at the end. But you can also see how they relate to each other. It also will require an understanding of history in this episode, at least an appreciation of history. You don't have to be a history buff. But you have to have some knowledge of real history and not just the history that maybe the Catholic Church has taught or you learned at school or whatever else. You also need to realize that most people in society and today have been fooled by futurism. Futurism refers to all of the eschatological views that depend on a future antichrist. The Antichrist is going to walk into a Jewish temple. There's going to be a rapture, maybe. Uh, You know, there's going to be a millennial kingdom. All these things are futurist eschatology. People have also been deceived by preterism, which is everything is in the past. The Antichrist already happened. We don't have to worry about it. These two things, which, again, I've said, I've quoted what the Bible said many times, don't swerve to the left or to the right. These two things are the fruits of the Counter-Reformation i.e. the Jesuits. And the Jesuits, in doing so, and in moving your attention either to the left or to the right, have hidden the true Antichrist power from most Christians. So most Christians are deceived on these things, and you have to realize that this is the truth. And history is where the answers lie. So if you are not awake to that, then again, this will be tough to put together. You also have to have an appreciation of the general trajectory of history. For example, a lot of charismatics and post-millennials, people who are Christian nationalists, dominionists, NAR, all that crowd, there is a general belief, even if you're not, in general, because we are living in the devil's kingdom still, and it's ruled by the lie from the Garden of Eden that things are getting better, look at the secular crowd, evolution, transhumanism. It's all the same lie, folks. It's It's the lie that everything is getting better. And it will get better. But in reality, the Bible tells you the opposite. It tells you things are getting worse. Worse and worse until the return of Christ. Of course, once Christ returns, it's going to get immediately much, much better. 
But until then, they're getting worse. And so if you don't understand that, if you don't have a general appreciation for the trajectory of history, then this is another thing to keep in mind because that will block you from understanding the truth. You also have to know the identity of the two beasts in Revelation. So again, I'm going to be talking about all these things. Very important. The the identity of Mystery Babylon, who that really is. The identity of the man of lawlessness. I talk about all these things in my end time series. I also recently published an episode on the man of lawlessness to kind of do a little bit more of a deep dive. Although most of those things I've taken from my end time series, which I cover in my Mystery Babylon episodes. But either way... All of these videos, I have countless videos. On my website, I have a whole column for Christian nationalism. I have many, many videos on these things. So if what I talk about today receives a question mark in your forehead, then go and consult my library. Look at my end time series. On my website, I have a column for Christian nationalism videos. You can watch plenty there, the videos on the beast, so you can understand who the beast is. All of these things are really relevant. I'm also going to be releasing a documentary very soon. Probably by the time you see this video, well, yeah, it's actually going to be, actually will be probably released by the time you see this video. Hopefully, we'll see what happens with everything going on in the world. But it's going to be called, Should Christians Be Involved in Politics? That's going to be kind of my documentary on the whole Christian nationalism, dominionism thing that's going on. And so that's another resource for you. All these things are very, very good resources because today we're going to integrate everything. I'm going to do my best. I really am. And I hope that it will convey the importance of everything I will put forward and also give you tools and resources to be edified, to edify others and to be prepared, emotionally, mentally, physically. Today, we're going to look at a lot of things, but my goal is to give you an idea of things that will happen prophetically, so that you know what to expect and what to watch in the world and what not to watch, so that you aren't deceived, so that you aren't troubled, so that you're not worried about what's coming, but rather you're focused and you're staying strong despite the craziness in the world. Now, look, nobody can tell you what's going to happen 100%. Nobody can do that. And I'm not claiming to do that. However, I will do my best given roughly 300 plus hours of research on end times topics, maybe more. I don't know. It's just been a big haze in the last year and a half of all the things I study every day. And end times has been a big focus of mine, obviously, with all the content that I've made. So I'm going to do my best given all of that effort to give you a very concise and well-presented presentation on what to expect from now until the return of Christ. Now, Jesus said that deception will be so great in the end times that it could fool even the elect if possible, meaning it could even deceive the people that God has reserved to save, but it won't. But that's how powerful the deception is. So, This is my comprehensive attempt at giving you resources and tools and weapons to fight against that deception. Now, if you're new here, make sure you subscribe and leave a comment, like, do all that kind of stuff. Every subscription and comment saves the Fennec Fox, so make sure you do that. Now, there's a quick objection, of course, that immediately comes up whenever these types of episodes or content is produced, which is from Matthew 24, verse 36. And Jesus says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows but even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So there you go. Jesus said you can't know when he's going to come. So there's no anything talking about timelines or these types of things. We shouldn't do that. Is this what we should take from this verse? And of course, the answer is no. First off, if you believe in the Trinity, which you should as a Christian, God is a triune being of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Everything that the Father has is mine. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. All of these statements of unity mean that there is no possible way that the Son could not know when he is coming back to the earth. So therefore, we have to reject that interpretation. It doesn't mean that the Son doesn't know. A subordinationist reading of this 
would be that the son doesn't know, but the subordinationists don't believe that the son is equal with the father. Do you see the problem? So we have to reject that reading. Now, later in Acts, when Jesus is talking to the apostles, they say, so when they had come together, they, had, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. So he's not saying, I don't know. He's saying it's not for you to know the appointed times and seasons that the Father has fixed according to his own authority. So this is a clue. This is a clue as to what he means earlier in Matthew 24. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, this is Paul speaking now, and he says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, of course, in English, it's kind of a strange sentence, and there's a reason for that. Because in the Greek... It actually means I decided to make nothing known to you, make known to you other than Jesus and, uh, and him crucified. So basically he's saying, I made nothing known to you other than the gospel. I focused completely on the gospel when I was with you. That's what he's saying. But in the translated English, it doesn't come across that way because of the way the words are used. When it says to know, it's really to make known, given the original language, meaning that we go back to Matthew 24, where Jesus says, but concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in he or heaven of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. I.e., no angel is going to appear to you in a dream or a vision or like Joseph Smith and tell you when Christ is returning. Nobody's going to tell you. No human being is going to tell you the date. The Son is not going to tell you. The Father alone would be the one to decree such or to declare such a thing, and he won't because it's a surprise. So this is a very important thing because ultimately, A, nobody has the authority to tell you when Christ is returning, or will they be able to? Hence, all of the false rapture predictions over the last 200 years. So don't listen to anybody predicting Christ's return on a specific date. There are plenty of people out there doing that. I am not doing that. As you will hopefully learn in this presentation, I'm not doing that. I'm integrating evidence to give you an idea of what actually we are to expect prophetically and what to watch from now until the return of Christ, whenever that may be. Now, there are signs that God has given us, very specific signs, so we can discern the season of his return. I don't know what year Christ will return. I don't know what day he'll return. I have a hint about what day of the week he will return, and we'll talk about that. But nonetheless, nobody knows the date of Christ's return. That's not what this is about. This is about understanding that we are in the season of his return. And if so, what are the things that we need to be actually watching for? Very, very different. Specifically, we want to also realize that this is the generation which will be encountering the mark of the beast. And we'll look at all of this. So ultimately, all of it is coming together in our lifetimes. I truly believe that. And it's it's quite a realization to come to. It really is. Now, there's many variables on all this stuff. So we're going to focus on the basics, as I usually like to focus on. I like to focus on the basics because the basics help you navigate all of the crazy theories and opinions. And everybody's talking about prophetic this, prophetic that. You know, like, especially at the time of this video, the eclipse is next week. And if you've <laughs> been on the internet at all, everybody's talking about the eclipse. It's prophetic. It's going to have the end of the world. CERN is opening the bottomless pit and yada, yada, yada. How do you know that these things are prophetic? People are obsessed with signs these days and they're saying everything is prophetic. Oh, this is prophetic. Oh, look, a comet happened. That's prophetic. Does it say that in the Bible? Sure, there are astronomical signs that are listed in the Bible, but those signs are very specific. They're time-bound. They're connected to other things happening. So you have to read in context. Otherwise, you will be constantly alarmed by people saying, this is prophetic, this is prophetic. How do you know it's prophetic? You have to use evidence and context. And that's what we're going to do today because the devil has clouded what it means for something to be prophetic. Not only has he changed the times and laws, i.e. like with the Sabbath and with the prophecies, he's inverted how the time prophecies are, are read, 
through futurism and preterism. He's also manipulated people into believing like everything is prophetic. There are so many watchmen and watchwomen on YouTube that are constantly covering things like, you know, the chicken flu or the eclipse or the comet or the devil comet or whatever else, prophetic signs of the end. How do we know what signs should be the ones that we should actually be watching for? This is my goal with you today, is to show you and to edify you in the truth so that you are not shaken to the left or to the right. There's many things on the news, and there will be many, many more on the news. There's going to be many false signs and wonders. There are going to be many false flags. You need to know your Bible, and you need to know the timeline to the end. And that's my goal with this episode. That's why this is going to be so important. Like I said, probably one of the most important episodes I have ever produced. And I do not say that lightly because I've created a lot of very important content as far as it's relating to the end times. So this, keep it handy, review it if you need to. This is going to be in parts because it's just one of those things we have to go through many different parts. Watch it in parts if you have to. Share it with your friends. Take notes. Integrate this stuff so you are intimately aware of what is coming so that you're not deceived. And with that, let's go to part one, which is placing the current generation. All right, well, in this part, we want to get a bird's eye view of where our generation is to show you evidence upon evidence that we are indeed in the final generation based on simply everything that's happened on history, on what the Bible shows us. Now, I talked about this end, time, end times prophetic timeline. This is the actual Google sheet, and you have access to this. This is free. You can download it on, the, uh, on my website where you go to danceoflife.com. Go to Bible Studies, click on End Times, and you'll see it as a resource there to download. It's a Google Sheet that you can zoom in. Of course, we're going to zoom out in just a second, but as you can see, it's got all the props. So it's got a timeline in the middle, and of course, it goes to the side this way. It's got a timeline in the middle, and with, with basically century marks from about 700 BC, and all of the prophecies of Revelation are on top in order, and all the prophecies in Daniel are on the bottom. So it's a very handy resource. And again, if you're a visual person, I am. So I wanted to create this. So this is the zoomed out view. And again, the middle is the timeline. I know it's kind of hard to see the objects and stuff, but we're just going to look at the major chunks. If you look at Daniel, we start with Daniel. This is, remember, Daniel's on the bottom. And it starts with Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and then the rest of the prophecies in Daniel. But as you can see, there is, um, if I can get the scrolling, is so tiny. This is the statue, right? So Daniel 2 receives a, a vision of the statue of various stages. And we have passed the four empires. We're at the final stage where the toes, you know, the, the clay, iron mixed with clay. The next thing to happen in that vision is that the rock formed by no human hand, which is, of course, Jesus returns and destroys this empire. And, of course, you also see these different empires that have happened and the little horn that came out, and that also has been fulfilled. Then you have basically the, some of these visions skip a few things. This is Daniel A with the, with the horn, the uh, ram and the goat vision. And you can see the little horn that comes out of there as well. And then you have the vision of the 2300 days, the Messiah, the 1260 days, so all these things you can see there in the past, because what, if we look at this little arrow here, if I can actually zoom in, let's see, where are we at? This is, you are here, slightly 2020, whatever. So we're at the end, right? We're at the end of this chart, whenever again, I don't know when Jesus will return, but we can have a decent idea of the season through today's episode. Now, at the top, you see there's Revelation, and these obviously start a little bit later because it's more concerning with the church age and the New Testament, but you have basically the phases of the church. Now, we are in the seventh church. You have the seals and the various trumpets that are judgments, and these happen. Of course, all of these happen except the seventh. So we are in the seventh 
church, and we're in between the sixth and the seventh seals. And also we see the 1260 year period, of course, that inter, inter, intersects with the little horn power, the wound happening to the beast, and then the second beast arising, and then we are in transition. We're in transition to the kings of the earth giving their power to Mystery Babylon. So this is a very useful resource. You can check it out on yourself. It's obviously a lot better when you can look at it yourself and uh, zoom in and do all that stuff. But ultimately, again, we are between the sixth and seventh seals. This is a fact. The sixth and seventh seals are not future. You have to understand this. We're between the sixth and seventh trumpets. We are in the seventh final church, which is Laodicea, which is the lukewarm church. We are in the toes of the Daniel 2 statue, and we are in the little horn period of Daniel 7, 8, and 11. Now, the little horn, again, Daniel saw the bigger picture. He didn't see the little horn getting wounded and coming back to power and all this stuff. This is where John fills in. So that period intersects with all of the other things I just mentioned. So we are at the end of the end. We're at the end, for sure. Most of Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. This is a fact. When you plot it all out on a graph, as I did in the end times prophetic timeline, you will see very clearly that we are at the end. Now, the question is, how much time do we have left? Based on just that, it's not very clear. It could be 100 years. It could be 50 years. It could be 20 years. We really don't know based off of that limited amount of information. But we will see a more reasonable outcome because it's actually less, I believe, than that. Now, what about the seven bowls? Because seven bowls also happen and they're listed. And the thing to remember, and we're going to reiterate this point as we get deeper and deeper into this, the seven bowls are distinct from the seven seals and the seven trumpets because the seven bowls actually start with the mark of the beast. In Revelation 16, verse 2, it says, So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. So meaning, we have a timestamp there. God is very specific. The first bull plague is happening after the mark of the beast have been enforced. This is an important thing to remember, meaning they're, they're not yet. The bulls have not happened yet. And this will come back in a later point about the, the river Euphrates drying up. Because a lot of people are saying, oh look, the Euphrates is dry, dry, dried up. And the fallen angels are being released and all this other stuff, which is just not true. These are futurist deceptions. So the seventh bowl and the seventh trumpet and the seventh um, seal all intersect 777 with the return of Christ. How do we know that? Well, let's read all the different uh, texts. In Revelation 8.5, this is the seventh seal. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, pay attention to this, peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. That's the seventh seal. Okay, seventh trumpet, Revelation eleven nineteen. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen with his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Same thing, really, just from a different perspective. Revelation 16, verses 17 through 18, the seventh bowl. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake. Such there had never been <clears throat> since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. So, same thing for each one. Now, Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 27 says, For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. This is a supernatural event. When Jesus returns, you will not be able to miss it. Believe me, they're not going to be able to counterfeit that. Now, they may try, and we'll explore that in this episode. But when Jesus returns, there's going to be great lightning. There's going to be an earthquake. The entire sky will be opened. It's going to be insane if we're still alive by that point. Of course, there will be people alive. My, my point is not everybody's going to be alive. And that's another thing we'll have to talk about today as well. But either way, the seven, 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 the seventh bowl, seventh seal, seventh trumpet, they all intersect with the return of Christ. So what does this look like if we looked at an image so you can see it for yourself?
Okay, well, I had my little image preview on a totally different part of the screen, so that was fun. Okay, so this is the image. This is just a just a little, you know, a little sketch that I made, but it's basically you can see the seven seals. These are not historically accurate here. This is just a graphic to show you the relationship. But the seven seals is from the believer's perspective, and they're happening throughout history. Then you have the seven trumpets also happening throughout history. Again, they're not happening at the same time. This is not a historically accurate graph. It is just a relational graph. Because what happens is, if we zoom in here, here's the sixth seal, here's the seventh seal, here's the sixth trumpet, here's the seventh trumpet. Do you understand? We're in between these two. All this, all the mark of the beast, all this stuff is yet to happen. It's in this final piece of history. Well, once the mark of the beast happens, the bull judgments begin to happen. So really, we're kind of in between, you see this little tiny set of seals right here? We're right between them starting. Does that make sense? So the sixth and seventh trumpet and seal have already happened. The seventh trumpet and seal align with the seventh bull, which is the return of Christ. If we go, if I just zoom out, return of Christ. See, it all happens at the same time. However, the seventh, this, uh, the bulls happen between the sixth and seventh seal, which is yet to happen. Does that make sense? So we are waiting for the mark of the beast to go live and start to be persecuted, and then the bull judgments will happen. So we'll talk more about this stuff in a little while. So enforcement of the mark is going to trigger the seven bulls. These bull plagues are very similar to the plagues in Egypt. If you've ever read parallel verses between the two. They're, they're very similar. The judgments are basically on this pagan system. So what that means is really they're going to be fulfilled actually very quickly, which is a good thing. We're not looking, like once the bold judgments start, we're not looking at 10 years of judgments. My guess is probably a year, and we'll talk about that in a second, give or take. I really don't know. Again, I'm not trying to set a specific date. We're trying to get an approximation given on everything that God has given us in prophecy and in history. Either way, the focus should always be to monitor the status of the mark of the beast. This is the thing that we need to be watching for, folks, because as th this is the, I don't know what the right word is, maybe the, the, the linchpin or the barometer, this is the barometer that's going to determine how things go. When they start persecuting people for the mark of the beast, I'm talking throwing people in jail, executions, things like that. Again, it sounds crazy, but look, this is where history is headed. Once they start doing that, that is the sign. Then you start looking and, and seeing what the first, what is the first bull? Well, it's going to be sores on people who took the mark. You're going to see some supernatural judgments happening. And of course, Christians will be kept safe from the place, just like the Israelites were kept safe. Now, if you, need, if you need a refresher on all this stuff with the Mark of the Beast, I have plenty of episodes. In my End Time series, is an episode on the Mark of the Beast. In my Sabbath series, Sabbath, Sabbath number one, Sabbath number seven, and Sabbath number eight. All of those episodes will edify you in the truth about what is coming, especially Sabbath number eight, with, which is the history of Sunday laws into current events and how they're pushing for this Sunday thing as part of this Christian nationalist system that is going to come to power. So that tells us that we are in the final generation. Now, the question is, how much more time do we have left? And we're going to explore that in ensuing parts. Now on to part two, we're going to talk about the beast in Revelation 13. All right, so in this part, I want to talk about the two beasts of Revelation 13, which is, of course, the papacy, the Catholic system, and the United States, which is the second beast or the false prophet. Again, if that's news to you, go check out all the resources I mentioned before. Now, the first beast, we know that the papacy ruled for 1260 years already from 538 to 1798. So that's in the past. That, that chunk of prophecy has been done. It already received its mortal wound when the Pope arrested, or when the uh, Napoleon's general arrested the Pope. And so the world is not yet worshiping the beast. It's not marveling after, I mean, it is marveling after the beast, but we're not at the point where 
it's come back to glory. Make sense? So we're in the in the gap of time between the wound and the beast receiving worship. In Revelation 13, verse 3, it's very clear. It says, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole world, on the whole world, uh, the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Now, in this sentence is a lot of time. You have to understand this. Just like how we had that episode on the crucifixion, how well, in my Sabbath series, I talked about how the crucifixion reveals the, the Sabbath. When you read through the gospel accounts, if you read through them quickly, you don't get a sense of how much time passes even between one or two sentences. But they're just reporting to you the facts. They're not giving you every single detail. So you have to read slowly and carefully. This sentence that I just highlighted, Revelation 13, verse 3, is a lot of time. This is practically the little horn power all in one sentence. When he says one of its one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. Okay, great. That's 1798. But its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So between these two segments of this sentence, right, where the comma is, this is where we are. We're at the comma. Of course, I don't know if there was a comma in the original language, but who knows? We're at the comma. We're in between these two things. The mortal wound has happened. The Vatican was created in 1929. It got all The Pope got all his territories back. has got his glory back. People have been marveling after the Pope. The image of the beast is being built. All these things are being constructed, but we're not there at the point where it says the wound was completely healed and the whole earth marveled after as they followed the beast. We're not there yet, but we're close. So that's another time indicator. Now, the question is, what happens in this gap? Because when John tells you these things, he doesn't tell you all the details. He just tells you the beast comes to power, it receives a mortal wound, it heals, and the world basically worships it. Well, how does that happen, John? Well, let me tell you, let me go back a little bit. And then he talks about the second beast. And the second beast, of course, is the false prophet who builds the image of the beast, which is a representation of the first beast, meaning the first beast was a Christian nationalist empire. The image of the beast will be a representation of that, and people will worship the beast. That is the answer that John gives to the comma that we are in. How does the beast come back to power? Well, it comes back to power because there's another power that comes to help it return to its former glory. So we are in the process of the image of the beast being completed. This is another marker to watch alongside. Well, they're related. The mark of the beast and the image of the beast are really related. Because remember, it's the image of the beast that enforces the mark. So these two things are things to watch. When the image will be finished, the kings of the earth will give their power to mystery Babylon, i.e. Revelation 17. I think verse 8, or I don't know, I forget the exact verse, but it's Revelation 17. The kings of the earth will give their power to the woman riding the beast. And that's when Revelation 13 verse 3, the second part of that statement, that the world is marveling after the beast and the wound is completely healed, that's when that is fulfilled. It's talking about the same thing. It's just from different pictures. The, John, especially in Revelation, does a lot of recapitulation. He layers over the same truth from different perspectives. So you can see a very rich picture of the end times. It's truly, truly profound, very well written. Now, the second beast is the United States, and we know that the second beast has already come. So that's another marker that we're at the end of the end. The second beast has developed many false signs and wonders, especially over the last hundred years or so. Freemasonry, Hollywood, mega churches, the charismatic movement, the prosperity gospel, CBN, TBN, Pure Flix, Angel Studios, the Hallow app, number one app in the world, and it's a Catholic app, New Apostolic Reformation, the personal growth movement, the New Age movement, the New Thought movement, if you know what that is. It's a kind of a Christian New Agey type of thing progressive Christianity, social media. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. All of these things were happening in the United States. They originated in the United States as a way to shape culture throughout the whole world. Now, of course, the first thing that that did was to shape culture in a liberal direction. But of course, if you know the dark to light dialectic, that's all by design so that people can come back to the right, which is what is happening but all of these things I just listed off have intensified greatly, especially in the last 20 years or so. The image of the beast, meaning meaning the image of the beast is almost done. If we're watching for the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, 
These things are at the precipice. And again, if you've watched any of my recent videos, my dark to light videos, my Christian nationalist videos, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, there's an important point that I want to make here before we proceed on the term Christian nationalism. I saw a recent video, somebody sent it to me, on a pastor, I believe he was actually Seventh-day Adventist, and he had something good to say about Christian nationalism, which is that there's nothing Christian about it. It's a counterfeit Christianity. So when we call it Christian nationalism, we're kind of almost validating it like it's Christian, when it's really not. So we should try to aim, at least in our own minds, to say so-called Christian nationalism, counterfeit Christianity, whatever works to, to remind you that this is not actually Christian. It's not Christian at all. Christianity is a way of being. It's not a religion. Christianity is not something that unifies with government. Christianity is tolerant and compassionate and loving. It doesn't force its views on anybody who doesn't obey. So there's nothing Christian about Christian nationalism. So I just thought I'd make that point because ultimately we are going to come at a point where we will see what you've learned about Constantine and the church-state union that happened a long time ago, except with social media. You're going to see that because history repeats itself and we have to be prepared for that. But nonetheless, realize that when you're fighting against it and you're calling it out, it does it, so so that it doesn't look like you're a Christian fighting against something Christian. Make sense? Christian nationalism is not Christian. There's nothing Christian about it. It's a counterfeit. So we as true Christians oppose it because it's a counterfeit, not because we're one group of Christians opposing another group of Christians, if that makes sense. That's really important. It was a good, a good distinction. Again, some resources are the Sabbath 7 and 8 in my series, the Dark to Light episodes. You can search for those. Uh, on my website, just go to the news archive, just type in dark to light. You'll find all of them there. Christian nationalism column on my website. And again, my documentary on should Christians be involved with politics. Now, the point is that all these things are imminent. If you really take all these things together, the breadth of all the things that I just shared with you about the image of the beast, all these things that are happening politically, they're very imminent. After 2024, very likely the image will be finished and it will start to be implementing, it will start to implement these various Sunday laws and things like that, like Project 2025. All these things are going to happen very quickly. Right now, the world is flipping from left to right all over. I, I talked about China, I talked about Europe, South America, Canada, the US. Obviously, Trump is, is being poised to come back and be everybody's savior. This is happening. And of course, the United States is the false prophet which will export the new thing to the whole world, just like they did with liberalism, they're going to do it with the conservative side because now social media is even more influential. So it's going to go even faster, which again is why I believe we have such an imminent sense of all of this. We don't have 100 years. We don't have 50 years. We don't even have 20 years. I believe it's going to be something more like 10 10 years or less. And again, I'm not setting a date, but if you look at the writing on the wall, it's very clear. So now let's go to part three, which is the image of the beast and mystery Babylon. Okay. So we're going to dive a lot deeper into the image of the beast now and to get an idea, but hopefully you're starting to see how this is shaping up to be a very imminent situation. Bible prophecy shows us that we have most prophecy being fulfilled. When we look at politics and history and current events, we see that the image of the beast is very close to being completed. So it's giving us an increasingly more imminent feeling of the fact that this is the generation of the Lord's return, which hallelujah, man, regardless of how bad it gets, hallelujah. Every Christian in history has wanted to be in this generation. So praise the Lord. Thank God that you have eyes to see. Thank God that you're here and not during the crusades or, you know, the first century church where people were getting crucified. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter. 
We are in the generation of the Lord's return, and that's something to rejoice regardless. Now, like I said before, just like they ex- they exported liberal culture, so again, you have to understand history. You have to understand the dark to light thing. You have to understand that they use dualities to accomplish their little Kabbalah crown purpose, their capstone of the Illuminati pyramid. Dualities are integrating. The last however many g- generations have been liberal, communist, woke, on the left, that was by design so that they could prep everything to swing to the right, which is what they're doing. Now, after World War II, there was a shift. The communists won World War II, the dark one. It's been a dark ever since. And liberalism has just increased throughout the whole world. The American liberal culture has been exported throughout the whole world. That was after World War II. In the same way, they're going to export the American new charismatic Christian nationalist personal growth, new age religion, whatever it's going to be, to the rest of the world, just like they did. But this time you have social media, Facebook, you know, TikTok, all the stuff that is shaping culture exponentially faster. So this time it's going to be the same thing that happened last time, but it's going to happen much faster and in the opposite direction, obviously. It's going to happen very quickly because of technology and of the platforms that we have. Remember that after World War II, it took decades because people didn't have, you know, the internet. But imagine how quickly they can shape culture. They are, the Jesuits and the secret societies, you have to understand, okay, again, going back now, even more history. Remember, the Jesuits were the ones who had the theaters in Europe. They were using the theaters and narratives and exciting stories and all this stuff for centuries before Hollywood. And by the way, Hollywood was Catholic when it first created. It, it's become very liberalized. But there's the core Catholics like Gibson and Scorsese and so on that are they're there, still pillars of the old thing. And it's, the old thing is going to be the new thing pretty soon. It's going to flip to the right. A lot of celebrities are converting to Catholicism and Christianity, in quotation marks, they're all converting. And so Hollywood is a tool of the beast. Sometimes it uses for liberal agenda. Sometimes it uses for the you know conservative agenda. It used to be conservative. So the Jesuits are the ones who've been shaping narratives for hundreds of years, man. If you really understand the breadth of the um, counter-reformation, how they've infiltrated society with so many lies, lies against the gospel, lies against on cosmology, lies against everything from history, like the art of war. We talked about how that was a Jesuit invention. Lies upon lies upon lies. Designed to confuse and shape culture into this new thing. They've had centuries of practice at shaping culture, believe me. And of course, if you've done any work on the Jesuits, you know that. And so now add to the mix all of the technology that we have and all of the history behind them that they had to practice, it's not going to take another 50 years or 80 years for culture to shift rapidly into the new thing. In fact, there's a reason why it's getting more intense between the two. Like with Biden recently declaring, I think, Easter, the National Transgender Visibility Day or something like that. People are just up in arms over that, but you don't realize that that's done on purpose. Biden's a Catholic, dude. It's done on purpose. It's so done on purpose to get you all riled up and say, look, this antichrist, atheistic, satanic system is coming after our Easter. We better fight. Bring religion back into schools. That's the whole point. And the attacks are getting more and more intense. Why? Because the the goal is to push you very quickly in the opposite direction, very in a very extreme direction very quickly. Do you see the point? You know, it's a random tangent, but it's going to make sense. I used to play racquetball quite a lot. I love racquetball. It's a very ADD little sport, if you've ever played it, especially when there's three guys or three people on a court. And, you know, it's going everywhere. The ball's bouncing everywhere, up, down, left, right. It's very fun. But there's a very simple lesson in that. If I have a ball and I'm throwing it against a wall, the intensity that I throw that ball against the wall is going to determine how much it bounces the opposite direction. Are you getting my point? If I just kind of touch it and lob it, it's just going to, you know, not do much. It's going to just 
you know, touch the surface of the wall and, and fall down, which is a strategy actually is done in racquetball to fool people into thinking that you're going to hit it really hard and then you fake them out. But the point is this, they are pushing at you harder and harder and harder because the desired outcome needs to happen very, very quickly to push you in the opposite direction. All of this is going to happen very, very quickly. That's why I said it's not going to be 20 years. It's probably going to be like 10 years or less that we're going to see all these things being fulfilled. With this new culture of the image of the beast that's going to be coming on the scene very soon, is inextricably tied the Sunday law, the Sunday laws, the Sunday rest, and all of the things that we've talked about, which is the mark of the beast. This needs to be watched. So I am going to encourage you to send me emails, tutor at danceoflife.com. Send me emails when you see headlines for Sunday legislation, because I plan on covering that as time goes forward. That is one thing I definitely want to cover as to having our fingers on the thermometer of what's going on with anything. So now if you want to get an idea of the kind of things that I'm looking for, watch my Sabbath episode number eight so that you know what kind of stories. Right now, the stories are all about why the Sabbath, oh, the Sunday rest is just such a good thing. They're not talking about Sunday legislation yet. They have to prep the culture. Remember, there's atheists, there's liberals, there's new agers, there's pagans. All these people need to be brought in and herded in into this new thing. So we're not at the point where the beast has shown its fangs. We're at the point where they're prepping things up and getting the image. The image is not finished yet. Either way, when you see headlines on Sunday, Sunday rest, Sunday being tied to climate change, these types of things, watch my episode uh, number eight in the Sabbath series. You'll get an idea. Send them to me, tutor at danceoflife.com so that I can add them to my list. We need an army of fennec foxes out there paying attention with their ears and their cute little noses sniffing out all of the trouble that the beast is doing. Now, the sequence of this is going to go something like this. At first, they're going to come out with Sunday laws, which will be very much pro-resting. There's going to be a lot of propaganda and culture around why it's good to rest on Sunday and, you know, why it's good for the environment and so on, which already has started. In fact, if again, if you watch my number eight episode in the Sabbath series, you'll see the propaganda has just been blasted as of this year, 2024, which is very interesting. They're getting ready for the shift from dark to light. And they're slowly going to add more things to it. Eventually, as, as it gets culturally adopted, they're going to add some restrictions to things and create anti-Sabbath laws. Those are going to be next. They're not going to be first. They're not going to say you can't rest on Saturday. That's not going to make sense. They're going to make the culture desire to rest on Sunday they're going to bring this new thing to the world. Everybody's going to be part of it. And as that gets integrated, the propaganda will shift towards the true Bible-believing Christians, which is the Sabbath keepers. So you'll see anti-Sabbath laws, just like they had with Constantine. Remember, within 100 or 150 years of Constantine passing his law, you had things like, don't Judaize, otherwise you're going to be shut out from Christ. People were starting getting persecuted for keeping the Sabbath on Saturday. Now that took about 100 to 150 years after Constantine passed his first law of, son, of honoring Sunday. But remember, that was ancient history. That was like 1,700 years ago. They didn't have telephones. They didn't have TVs. They didn't have smartphones. They didn't have the internet. Culture shaped very, very slowly. Now the devil has everything at his disposal to shape culture extremely quickly. So again, these things will happen. History repeats itself, but the difference is it's going to happen much faster. We're going to go from, oh, it's good to rest on Sunday to, hey, if you're resting, if you're not resting on Sunday, you're a heretic. That time gap is going to be very, very uh, different. It's going to be much quicker. All the tools that the dark is developing and using that you see, for example, CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currencies, blockchain, crypto, AI, all these things that are that, that have been in the news as kind of the dark, the antichrist thing that's going to come and kill us and globalist system, that's not going away, folks. You need to understand the bad cop is ultimately serving the good cop. They're both on the same agenda. The goal is to bring the devil to be worshipped. All of these things like AI and blockchain and crypto, 
and whatever, social credit scores and things like that. First off, we already are there to some degree. They're going to be adopted by the false light system. And they're going to be used. And why do you think they're investing in all this AI? Because ultimately, AI will help to control behavior and to check on people. To, to enforce this thing will require a lot of technology. And of course, they are developing it very quickly to be able to monitor people and to create a way, which again, the Bible warned you a long time ago. What did the Bible say? You cannot buy or sell unless you have the mark. Well, the only way that that could be fulfilled is if Satan has complete control over the money supply, which means a digital system. Everything's all about digital. And of course, they're pushing it in that direction. So all of these things will come into play. Don't think that they're going away just because Trump is coming into power. They're going to be adopted and used by the good cop. Eventually, this culture is going to be exported to the world. And this will lay the foundation for the kings of the earth to give their power to the woman. So the image of the beast needs to be fulfilled. And it's going to be fill, fulfilled in the United States first. You have to remember that. That system, then the next thing we need to watch. So right now we're watching what? We're watching the image of the beast and all this Christian nationalist stuff that I cover, all the dark to light stuff that I cover throughout the whole world. That's what we're watching because we're watching to see when are they going to pull this off? And of course, it's going to be very soon. But once that's done, the next thing to watch is how it's being exported to the rest of the world. India, let's say, converts to Christianity. Maybe you see a revival in the Middle East. We'll talk about that. All of these things will be signs that they are getting closer and closer to integrating the world into a one world system. But remember, most of the last 2,000 years, 1,400 of them, over 1,400, were a Christian nationalist empire. Of course, there's nothing Christian about it, but that's what we call it nonetheless. It was a Christian nationalist empire. Meaning most of history has been like that. And it's going to come back, is what the Bible tells you. History repeats itself. The question is, when is that going to happen? And if you look at any of the stuff I'm presenting to you, it's going to happen very soon. Now, there's an interesting dialectic with this that I've talked about in my Sabbath series, which is this whole, which day is the first day of the week? If you recall, we there was a map. I didn't pull it up here, but actually, you know what? Let's just do this. Okay, so this is the thing I was talking about with this map. This is on Wikipedia if you look up week on, on Wikipedia. And the problem is this. If you look at the world currently, the, the countries in blue have Sunday as their first day of the week, meaning they operate according to the Constantinian calendar. Whereas the countries in beige are operating to a different calendar. In fact, actually, they're operating, I don't know, it's a, when that calendar was made. I didn't really bother to research it. But they're operating according to Monday being the first day of the week. Sunday is the seventh day of the week for these people in the beige. So this, to me, is an interesting dialectic. And of course, you have the Muslim countries, but Muslim, Islam is going to be integrated either way. The Muslims believe that Saturday is the... I think, uh, let's see, Saturday is the first day of the week. Yeah, so they have their own thing going as well. So this is an interesting dialectic. And the reason I brought it up to you is because they may, I shouldn't say they may, they have to figure out something. Because if you are telling people to rest on Sunday, but for some it is the seventh day of the week, which honors God. Because remember, this is not about what name day you rest on. It's not what it's about. God's instructions are, Work six, rest on the seventh. That is what honors me because in the sequence of seven days, I rested on the seventh as the creator. And I also rested in the tomb as the redeemer with Jesus Christ. Seven is what honors God. The devil is not going to make you rest on the seventh day of the week. So this is an interesting dialectic to me because it reminds me of, again, the dialectic that the Roman Empire had that pushed Constantine to make one world calendar which is what we still use today, most of the world, at least half of the world, whatever. So if you remember, the Romans had eight and seven day calendars, meaning that there was a lot of confusion. And so everybody was like, we need a standard calendar. Well, this may happen as well. This is something to watch. 
as this system goes out into the world, if the calendars are all going to come into sync and everybody's going to honor Sunday as the first day of the week so that they can all rest on the first day of the week. Again, I doubt that they will legislate Sunday as the seventh day. Of the week. They have to go either way. See my point? Has to go either way. They can't have like one of the one part of the world being first day of the week and another part of the world being the seventh day of the week. That's not going to work because now you're telling people to rest on the seventh day of the week and they're honoring the creator. You know, the, the devil's not going to let you do that. So something's going to something's going to change and that'll be something to watch as they as this system gets exported to the rest of the world. Another thing to watch is the calendars and maybe pushing for legislation to honor Sunday as the first day of the week and, and shift everything over so that we are in alignment with our brothers and sisters in other countries. Do you get the point? It has to be that way. One way or another, they have to do it. Now, once this image is exported to the rest of the world and everybody has adopted this Christian nationalist state system, then the world will worship the beast again. The image of the beast, which is this new system, will enforce obedience and begin to pass these laws. And it will become very, very strict very quickly. Again, we're not looking at 100 years or 150 years. We're looking at probably a few years. Once this image comes to power, is exported to the rest of the world, the kings of the earth give their power to the pope, to the woman riding the beast, and you start seeing legislation Oh, it's good to rest. Propaganda, it's good to rest on Sunday. Yada, oh, are you resting on Sunday or Saturday? Oh my gosh, don't listen to those Judaizers. You will see those things. It will be a crazy thing to see. It really will. But history tells us that these things will happen. Nonetheless, just like you saw alternative media, like places like Rumble or, you know, all these news sites like, um, oh, I forget. Anyway, the name of all these, like, conservative news stations that are alternative news. But anyway, all these alternative people were demonizing the left, the big, bad, evil, deep state, and they're telling you the truth about them and so on and so forth. You will see this happening with Bible believers eventually. The media is going to switch because right now it's the dark. They're going to come to the light. You have the alternative media rising. The old legacy media is going to be destroyed and made ashamed of themselves because they've been totally discredited. But the now the charming, good-looking, clean-cut alternative media is going to come to the light, and eventually that's going to be the thing, just like it was with the legacy media for decades. That was the media, was the dark. They had a spin on everything. It was the leftist spin. Well, get ready for the right spin, and eventually you're going to see propaganda on TV Speaking against people keeping the Sabbath. Oh, did you see the you know, so and so? Or so do they keep Saturday on Sunday? There's a cult now teaching that you can rest on Saturday. It's going to happen, folks. These types of th these types of stories and and situations will happen. Just be prepared to see that the media will be involved very much in this new thing. I mean, look at you can already see traces of it, like with Fox. I call them Catholic News, Fox News. They're constantly covering Catholic. Affairs, Catholic things, and, and propping the beast up as this good thing. And, of course, catering to this image. They're part of the image of the beast. CBN, TBN, they're Protestants, but they're working for the beast. They're all about Christian nationalism, Christian Zionism, all these false ideologies. That's only going to get worse and worse as time goes on. That's another thing to watch. All of these media pundits and how aggressive they are at Sunday keeping and eventually against people who don't want to keep Sunday. That's something to watch. That's a sign. Because again, Jesus said that there will come a day when people will betray you and, you know, kill you in the name of God, of course. Again, imagine Constantine's day with all those legislations and after Constantine where they said, don't Judaize, otherwise you're going to be shut out from Christ. Imagine all of that with social media and TikTok, and the news, and your phones, and all this technology, and AI. Imagine, it's just a crazy thought, but that's what's that's where the world is headed. There will be economic sanctions eventually on people who do not want to participate, and eventually there'll be prison time, and possibly tribunals, and even executions. That's something to come to terms with. Once all of this starts happening, that's why I said the mark of the beast is the barometer for all of this. And in God's genius, 
Look at the genius. In God's genius, he has, he works all things for the good, man. He truly does. It's, it's astounding how God does it. In his ultimate genius, he tied the thing that's supposed to be the most evil, for our generation at least, the scariest thing, the mark of the beast. He tied that to our blessed hope. Do you see the genius behind it? The worse this gets, the more we know it's getting closer and closer. Because once they start throwing you into prison, once they start you know, legislating you can't buy and sell, once people start betraying you, once there's tribunals, maybe an inquisition, who knows how it's all going to play out. But ultimately, we do know how it will play out. The devil will obtain worship and he'll persecute those who refuse. That's how it's going to play out. What the, the more evil it gets, the more joy and hope we have as Christians. It's truly amazing how God does it. He literally inverts the devil's inversion. It's, it's truly brilliant. But once this stuff happens and we start paying attention to these things and we see them in the world around us, we need to start watching for the bold judgments because they're very, very close. And that means that the second coming is very, very close. So the thing to be watching right now is the rise of Christian nationalism, the rise of Sunday laws, the rise of populism, the swing from liberal to conservative, the exporting of this ideology, especially in the United States, that's happening into the rest of the world. That is the thing to be watching. The fusion of culture with false Christianity, like if you know Life Surge, that whole personal growth slash kingdom builders type of seminars that they're doing, very popular. The Great Awakening Tour, pop Christianity, all of these types of charismatic movement, the prosperity movement. Of course, the, the life surge is like kind of prosperity movement 2.0. Because a lot of the prosperity gospel, you see, they do these things in waves. You have to understand, they do these things in waves because they're refining the deception. People like Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn, they're just old, worn-out goblins that have been very discredited. They deceived their fair share, and they got their reward for it from the Jesuits, but now they're just, they're not charming. You know, Kenneth Copeland looks like he's demon-possessed, very obvious. And ultimately, they have discredited themselves. So now we need a new round of fresh faces. Enter Life Surge and other events like it, where they have Jonathan Rumi from The Chosen with his, like, smoldering squint on the front and, you know, all these, like, patriotic guys with bandanas and, um, you know, personal growth uh, superstars like Ed Milet and, you know, all, just all the, the people that are charming that haven't been corrupted in terms of, you know, like public opinion. And this is the new thing. And there will be more and more types of these types of things that are fusing this materialistic pop Christianity with charismatic principles and Christian nationalism and patriotism. It's all merging into one thing. Also, another thing to look for is celebrity conversions to Christianity. I've covered those in my Jesuit Hollywood episode in the End Time series. You know, like, for example, Jordan Peterson. He's one of those dark delights that happen. And there's so many of them. I'm just picking him out. But, you know, his wife is Catholic and he's coming to come. He's going to come next. Just wait. Jordan Peterson will, will turn Catholic. Just give it. I don't know how long, but he, it'll be soon. In the increase in Catholic propaganda... Mel Gibson's coming out with a second Passion movie. If you've seen my End Time series, I break that down in the Counterfeit Spirit episode. All the occult themes in the Passion, which is something I do not recommend watching. I watched it when I was ignorant, and God used it for the good. But once you know the truth, you cannot possibly watch that movie as a born-again Christian. It is full of occult and Catholic propaganda. Now he's coming out with a Second passion about the resurrection, just in time for the dark to light shift. Do you see the point? Scorsese is also coming out with a movie on Jesus that's, you know, supposed to paint religion in a better light. All of this stuff is happening right on time. These are things to watch out for. This is part of the image of the beast. Keep an eye out, keep your ears up, and pay attention. Now, there's a prophetic clue in the picture of Jerusalem being sieged uh, in 70 AD. In Luke 21, verse 22, Jesus says, uh, the, actually, a little bit earlier than that, from 20 to 22, 
But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these days are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. So there's an important precedent here because the, the revolt, the whole thing with Jerusalem actually started in 66 AD. There were a lot of Jewish revolts, and that led to just on and on. There's also shifts in the Roman Empire because I think Nero passed away at that time, and they had to change governance, and so they came, they went away, and they came back. And, and so there was a lot of chaos happening in the Roman Empire and in Israel, in Jerusalem at that time. But it all started in 66 AD. Now, there's an important precedent with, um, if I can just get this, okay, this is from Imperium Romanum. It's probably a website on Roman history, but this is called the Expedition of Cestius Gallus. Cestius was a Roman general. And it's very important to understand something about Cestius. The expedition of the Legate of Syria ended in a devastating defeat for the Romans. Cestius Gallus had to withdraw from Jerusalem and was to lose 5,300 foot soldiers and 480 horsemen in the retreat. As Josephus wrote, the Legate collapsed with the defeat to such an extent that he died shortly after. His successor, commander of the rebel forces, was the late Princeps Vespasian. The insurgents, on the other hand, after a spectacular success, gained even greater self-confidence and the Roman-Jewish war dragged on over the following years. So basically what happened was in 66 AD, the revolt happened. There was a revolt, Jewish revolt, and that led to, you know, back and forward. Then the, the Cestius retreated and then the Jews killed a lot of the Romans. This infuriated the Romans, of course, so they came back and in 70 AD destroyed and leveled everything. Why is this significant? Well, because when Cestius surrounded Jerusalem and then departed, they, the believers in Jerusalem at the time, recognized that this was the sign that Jesus had foretold. When you see Jerusalem surrounded, that's the time to head for the hills. Now, of course, the immediate audience for this is Jerusalem and the judgment that the Christians of Jesus's day would experience. Of course, they were saved because the Christians escaped to a nearby place called Pella, and it was, it was a refuge city, and they weren't harmed. Those who heeded Christ's warnings were not harmed. That's an important point to take to heart. But it has a double fulfillment, and we, the, we, the reason we know that is because in Matthew 24, there is a lot of, there are a lot of things that in Matthew 24, Matthew 24 also talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. But it also talks about signs of the end that are clearly applicable to the end. For example, false Christ. There's been so many false Christs in the last hundred years alone, more than any other generation or period of time ever. There's been a lot more upheavals, wars and rumors of wars, people getting killed, like with communism. There's been a lot of crazy things that have happened in the last hundred, 150 years. Which, again, Matthew 24, because it also talks about Jerusalem and it has a double fulfillment, that means that Luke 21 also has a double fulfillment. So, what does that mean? Well, Adventists say that Jerusalem, and I agree with this, and not, not, not only Adventists say this, but Adventists are one of the few that are talking historically about Bible prophecy and double fulfillment and things like that. But Adventists and others say that Jerusalem represents the body of believers spiritually, meaning that when it's surrounded, that is a sign that the Antichrist power, which in this case is the beast, is the Pope, the, the papal institution, the Catholic system, is trying to get at the people of God. Now, Adventists specifically, now this is just Adventists, this is Adventist eschatology. Adventists appropriate that to the 1800s, when Alonzo T. Jones, which was an Adventist lawyer, I believe, fought against the uh, Congress of passing a blue law, a national Sunday law. So Adventists say, well, you see that the, the surrounding of Jerusalem already happened in 1800, so that's a sign to get out of the cities and to basically, you know, find refuge. I disagree. I don't think that this has been fulfilled. Because the reality is, when they start legislating Sunday laws, and the image of the beast is completed, and 
the propaganda starts to happen about resting on Sunday and, you know, be in line with the law and they're, and they're shaping culture to go in that direction, that's when you realize, okay, it's time to find an alternative. It's time to maybe be more self-sufficient. It's time to maybe make networks with other friends of like mind. We're going to discuss some of these points at a later part when we're talking about how to be prepared. But ultimately, I don't believe that Jerusalem, spiritual Jerusalem, has been surrounded yet. I think that that has yet to happen. I think that, that will relate to the image of the beast being completed, which is an important point because it means don't be an alarmist and think that, oh my gosh, now I have to go out and find a home out in the boonies and start you know, farming. That's not what this is about. It's just about understanding when is the proper trigger for these things. And again, I don't believe that that has happened yet because the image of the beast needs to come and start legislating laws. Remember, there's times in between those sentences. When it says that the image of the beast will come to power and it'll pass the, the mark of the beast onto people, we don't know what the time is. It's not saying like immediately after, you know, 2024, let's say, or 20, let's say Project 2025. As soon as that goes into effect, suddenly now we're in the mark of the beast. Well, not necessarily. We know that the mark of the beast has been around forever. It's been around since, you know, Constantine. That's the mark of the beast. Now, the mark of the beast is not an issue. It's not an, again, I've said this before, if you are Catholic or Orthodox or, you know, Protestant, you go to church on Sunday, you have not taken the mark of the beast. So don't panic. The mark of the beast has been around for a while, but the mark of the beast has not been enforced. The issue is when it's going to be enforced and you'll have to choose between God or the devil. That's the issue. That hasn't happened yet. And when that happens, that's when all of these things are aligning. When Jerusalem is being surrounded and they're starting to push that narrative, okay, well, we better get out of here and find some alternatives because they're going to really show their fangs pretty soon. With Jerusalem, it was three and a half years before the Romans came back, and, or I don't know if exactly that much, but they, they came, they went away and then they came back and they had some time. They definitely had time. We will have time. I don't know what that time amount is, but it can't be more than a few years. It really can't with the way the things are going. So that's part three. Now let's talk about Zionism and the third temple. All right, so now that we have a better understanding of the image of the beast and the sort of Christian nationalist agenda and Sunday laws and all that stuff, I want to switch gears and talk about my overall impression with Zionism, the Third Temple, all that narrative that's happening in the Middle East. We're also going to talk in the next part about how things will relate to this. So treat these two parts, this part and the next part, as kind of working together, because I'm not going to say everything in this part, but we are going to do a good breakdown. I'll preface and say that in my episode number six in my end time series on the third temple, that is a very valuable resource. So you understand the biblical, scriptural, historical foundations for all the things that I'm going to be talking about today. The beast created Zionism. You have to understand that. The papacy was behind the create along with the Rothschilds. They've been hand in hand for a while. They created the state of Israel because they needed the state of Israel for their false prophecy, their false futuristic Jewish focused prophecy. They needed it. And of course, that's why Zionism was created. The Jews were nobody. The Jews were nobody up until, you know, I, I would say the 1800s, really, not, not even that, till the 1900s. With, with the Bolsheviks and things like that. Of course, you had a couple of stragglers in there in the 1700s. You had um, the Rothschilds that came up. And then in the 1800s, you had Moses Hess, with, which was the father grandfather of Zionism, Theodore Herzl. But the Jews were really nobody. They really weren't up until the 20th century, which should tell you something very important if you understand who is controlling history and for what purpose. But the beast created Zionism and pumped it with money because they needed the Jews and they were, they were, they will use the Jews to accomplish their false prophecy. 
The Jews today are ready to sacrifice their heifers. Now, I don't know at the time of this video if they've already done it or if they have to do it in like a couple days. I don't know. Either way, that's going to happen. So obviously they're very committed to this. They're going to build the third temple. You have to remember also that the Jews are puppets. So when you see all this stuff about the third temple and happening in the Middle East, this is the power behind this is the Vatican. You have to remember this. A lot of people see the obvious stuff, and I've had a lot of comments on my videos like, no, you don't know the Rothschilds and the Jews. They look at all the Jews in politics and the Jews this, the Jews that. Look, the Jews are just papal puppets. You have to understand the Bible would warn you if that were the case. The Bible doesn't warn you about that. The Bible warns you about a counterfeit Christian power that receives its power from Satan himself. Meaning that out of all the vehicles on earth, there's a lot of vehicles that Satan uses to deceive people. He uses paganism, he uses New Age, he uses communism, he uses all these different vehicles. There's a lot of people who are antichrist. Let's put it that way, antichrists against Christ, fighting against Christ. But there is one that fulfills the word completely, which is in place of Christ and against Christ, and that is the papal institution. Out of all of the vehicles on earth and in history, the Bible tells you very plainly that the dragon gave his power to the beast, meaning the beast, i.e. the Catholic system, the papal institution, is the devil's chosen vehicle of how to manipulate the world and world events. That doesn't mean it's his only vehicle. It means that is his chosen vehicle. That is the one where the power is concentrated. You have to realize that. And that's what the Bible points you to. It doesn't point you to the Jews. It doesn't point you to, you know, the obvious thing. Again, there are, yeah, a lot of Jews in power. There are a lot of Jews in the pharmaceutical industry. There are, there's a lot of Zionist influence in the media everywhere. Of course, but who's the puppet behind, or who's the one, yeah, I mean, even the Pope is a puppet to the devil, but who is the one that is behind those puppets? It's the real evil, which is the papal institution and the Jesuits. The Jews were nobody, like I said, up until like 100, 150 years ago. And even Rothschild, who only came up in the 1700s, that was right around the time that the beast received its mortal wound, a little bit beforehand, I believe. But the Rothschild is in bed with the Vatican, and they've been in bed with the Vatican ever since. Besides, Rothschild means red shield. And of course, we know who is famous for their red shields, the Templars, who started investment banking. So there's that. Now, here's the main point. The question with all of this stuff is, how far are they going to go with this narrative? This is the question. And unfortunately, I don't have a simple one-liner that I can give you. I'm going to give you scenarios because it's really interesting where they're going to go with this. Either way, here's what will probably happen. The question is, will they counterfeit a false antichrist that will walk into this rebuilt temple? And if so, will they use that as a way to have Lucifer appear as the real, as quote-unquote Jesus, and destroy this quote-unquote antichrist and usher in a, in a millennial kingdom. Meaning, the thing that people believe, most people, most Christians believe, are they trying to counterfeit that all the way? That's the question. Or will it just be to ignite war in the Middle East so that there's some sort of dialectic to bring about world peace? This is the question. If you see these types of things happening, or you see a charismatic revival in Israel, where they flip everybody from dark to light, know that this is all part of the plan. If you see visions and some sort of, you know, Christian thing happening in the Middle East, if you see somebody walking into a rebuilt Jewish temple, this is all fake news, folks. It will be, <clears throat> excuse me, it will be a very powerful deception. Once they start building this temple, <laughs> it's going to be even harder to rescue people from dispensationalism. It really is, unfortunately. Even the people who aren't dispensationalists, they're going to think, oh, this is Bible prophecy. Just well-meaning premillennial Christians are going to be duped. And it's going to be even harder to tell them, no, it's not. Because the, the temple is this physical thing that just pulls your attention. And that's, that's the devil's tactic from day one, to gravitate your attention to the physical world so that you don't think spiritually. 
a lot of people know about the Noahide laws, but look, the Noahide laws will be integrated by the new thing. The Jews were persecuted by Catholics and hated for centuries. They were nobodies. The Crusaders raped and pillaged Jerusalem and did whatever they wanted to do. The Jews were kicked out of countless countries in Europe. Now, of course, there was a reason for that, but you can look into that yourself. But nonetheless, the Jews were a ragtag group of nobodies. The Noahide laws are not something you need to watch. You need to watch the Christian nationalist takeover because they will use and reintegrate those laws, however they'll do it, to apply towards Sabbath keeping on Sunday. Just watch, because just watch, that's what the Bible warns you about. But no matter what happens, remember it's all smoke and mirrors. It will grow even harder to wake people up because they are going, again, the question is how far are they willing to do it? And we'll look at that in the next part of this, but they are really going ahead with this. The Jews will sacrifice the heifers. They will probably start rebuilding the temple. They'll usher in their false Messiah, which we'll talk about. And many will be deceived and they'll believe the prophecy is unfolding. So hopefully you're not going to be one of them. But now let's go to part five, all roads lead to Rome. All right, well, welcome to part five. This is going to be all roads lead to Rome. And really, we're going to take a deep dive on all of the various threads that the beast is using to bring about this one world order, which the Bible, of course, warns you about. The new world order will happen. It's not going to be a communist dystopia. It will be something very different, but really kind of the same. Now, I want to start with this very important text from The Art of War, which I cover in my End Times series in the episode on the French Revolution. This is from the chapter 13 of The Art of War, The Use of Spies. Very important section, number eight, verse eight. When these five kinds of spy are all at work, none can discover the secret system. This is called divine manipulation of the threads. It is the sovereign's most precious faculty. Now, if you understand that the sovereign and the general are the two characters in the art of war, which really relates to the superior general of the Jesuits and the Pope as the sovereign. What is the main responsibility, according to the snake itself, of the Pope. The Pope's main responsibility is the divine manipulation of the threads, all of the threads weaving them into their final capstone. They tell you what they're doing, folks. You just have to understand and use the sword of truth so that you can see, because they have to tell you. That's, that's part of their religion. By the way, this is the responsibility of the sovereign is the divine manipulation of the threads. So we're going to look at all the threads today. And of course, maybe these are not all of the threads. I'm sure there's many more, but these are the major ones that I covered and the major ones that I see are important to be watching. Zionism, Islam, communism slash liberalism slash woke leftism, world religions or ecumenism, climate change, and the new age personal growth movement. All of these things as different as they seem, they will be integrated into one thing. And again, I know now why when John saw Mystery Babylon, he marveled greatly, greatly it says, that he marveled. And of course, you, you think, well, why? Well, now you realize why. These people are pulling this off. It's truly a marvel of wickedness for sure. But nonetheless, it is crazy. It's crazy how they're pulling it all off. Now, I've talked about these many times, but I'm just going to run, run through them really quick. Right now, political shifts are happening across the world from left to right. That is by design. And they're doing them at different times to allow the cultures to transition. Europe had a lot of Islamic immigration, which, of course, is pushing against people to come back to nationalism and populism and religion. We're not going to have our culture being destroyed by these infidels. And that's happening. There's a lot of destructive policies in the USA and in South America, South, uh, yeah, in Canada, like these leftist policies that are pushing people more to wanting nationalism. Of course, the timing is different for each country. They're not doing it all at the same time. Of course not. They have to take their time. They got to step by step. But if you watch these things carefully, they're flipping here, 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 and so on. 
China has its whole narrative with the underground Catholic Church that I've covered in my Darch Light episode. That's very interesting. Again, remember when Pope John Paul came to Poland. Poland right now, today, 40 years later, is the the most hardcore right country in Europe. Do you realize that? And 40 years ago, or whatever it was, I think 1979 or something, either way, it was about 40 years ago, when Pope John Paul went there and it was communist, people were like, oh, we want God back. And he sat there with his arms open wide. Of course, he's the cover on my Antichrist episode for a reason. People were receiving the beast and marveling after the beast. And they were communists. They wanted God back. Well, what they actually wanted was religion back. And that's the point. Communism is designed to make Catholicism look good. Do you get the point? That's why it was created. That's why it was exported to the rest of the world, because eventually they're going to bring Catholicism back to the rest of the world. So the whole thing with China is also very interesting to watch. All of these have different countries, different systems. And again, Art of War, Chapter 13, the use of spies. They have spies and Jesuit operatives in every single little part of the world. They have communist spies that are actually Jesuits. They have Protestant spies that are actually Jesuits. They have libertarians that are actually Jesuits. They have liberals and conservatives that are actually Jesuits or Jesuit infiltrated. And when these spies are all at work, what does it say? That's when the divine manipulation of the threats can happen, which is the sovereign's main priority. So you have to understand that these things are all in control. Now, the next one is Islam. And with Islam, there are three things that I see they're going to be using to integrate them back to the mother church. Of course, you know that Catholics, the Catholic system started Islam. Muhammad was surrounded by Catholics and Catholic converts. He was funded by the Catholic system. And they eventually rebelled. And of course, that led to the Crusades. But nonetheless, Catholicism began Islam, the mother of abominations. And Islam is an abomination because they're totally antichrist. But with Islam, they have a lot of very important threads that they're using. One of them is Mary, and I talk about that in my uh, End Times episode on the role of Islam. Another one is ecumenism. You see the Pope being friendly with the Imam, with the Abrahamic family house. I recently covered an episode of my ecumenism episode um, on just all the honors they're giving all these Muslim people, like knighthood now, papal knighthood and all this stuff. It's just, again, stuff to seduce them into a common way of thinking. And that's going to happen. They're going to get rid of the extremists and the ones that are in the middle. It'll all be part of the same thing. And of course, the last part of the, the last thread of that is the conflict in the Middle East. That Islam and Zionism are unique threads in that they are interdependent and they also require conflict in order for the next thing to happen. Whereas the other ones, like communism and Christian nationalism, climate change, we'll talk about all these, they're more like a dark to light shift. It's more about shaping culture. You don't necessarily need like, you know, a war or anything like that. But with Zionism and Islam, you need, you need a conflict in the Middle East. Of course, Zionism, we talked about it a little bit, but they're Avenue is this false prophecy that they're fulfilling through the third temple, which the Jews want, the uninitiated Jews want their Messiah to come, and so they're building the third temple. Of course, now this is an interesting thing because the papacy is using them for very different reasons, obviously, to fool the world into possibly world peace, possibly a false Christ. We'll explore that today. But Israel currently is largely atheistic and liberal. So they are a prime target for a charismatic dark to light revival. And of course, Christians believe that or expect that, oh, the Jews are going to have a revival. Ro read Romans 11, which of course, Romans 11 is not a prophecy at all. But this is what Christians have been duped into thinking because of Jesuit eschatology. So if you see that, that's something to have a Fennec Fox moment over. The third temple is probably going to be associated with the false messiah, if you know anything about the Yannicka. He's a man that's this prodigy. He's like 30-something years old, very charming little fellow. He's healing people. He's got. The, he's very mysterious because they're not talking about him too much. But very likely they're going to prop him up as the messiah. Now the question is, how are they going to play it out? If, if you understand that the conflict in the Middle East is necessary to bring about 
many threads together. For the Jews, for them, they need conflict in order to bring about the Messiah, which will force them to build the Third Temple, which, of course, fulfills the papacy's goals of, of this false Jewish prophecy that they've put forward through the Jesuits to deceive everybody. But it also fulfills Islamic prophecy too, which again, the Muslims were created by the Catholics. Amim al-Dari, who is the one who originated the whole thing about the, uh, oh, the Dajjal, the, the, the Islamic Antichrist, he was a Catholic. He got all this stuff from Catholic sources. So now put it all together. The conflict in the Middle East is going to alchemize all of these things. The Jews are going to build their temple because they want their Messiah. The Muslims believe that the Jewish Messiah is the Antichrist. So that needs to usher in a holy war. The Christians believe, the, most of the Christians believe that the Jews have to build this temple. And that means that, you know, Jesus will show up and destroy the Antichrist who's going to walk into it. Put, put one and one and one together, and what do you get? Well, you, what you get is the propensity for an incredible delusion to happen that integrates all of these things. The Jews are expecting a conquering Messiah. So what if Lucifer, let's put it this way, what if something happens where Lucifer shows up as a false Christ, manifests, destroys the false Antichrist. The Muslims are expecting Jesus to return too. Of course, they're expecting him to return with the Mahdi. But nonetheless, they're expecting him to destroy the false Antichrist too, which is the, the Jewish Messiah. The Jews will realize, oh my gosh, this is our Messiah. Jesus is our Messiah because he's supernatural and he, you know, he showed up to destroy everything because that's what they always wanted, false signs and wonders. There's going to be a charismatic revival in Israel. The Muslims are going to convert and realize that Jesus is, oh, Jesus is, is it. And the, the, Mahdi, the Mahdi is Jesus. We were wrong, but he did destroy the, the Jewish Messiah, so that means this is true. And of course, the Christians will be deceived into thinking, oh, Jesus is here, the millennial kingdom is here. So everybody's going to be appeased. Do you see how this works? It's truly fascinating. Everybody's going to be wrapped into this possible tangent. I, again, we'll, we're going to explore whether this is going to happen or not, but it could happen. And so that's something to be aware of with Zionism and Islam. Now you have the ecumenism thread, which I've talked about. I have a whole episode on that, and there's many other episodes. There are many councils, like the World Council of Churches, the World Council of Religions for Peace. There's so many of them, and they're meeting more and more frequently. They've been doing so for the last hundred years. And it's not going to be difficult. This one's not going to be hard at all, because most churches, remember, when it says Mystery Babylon's name, what is her name? She's the mother of abominations, but she's also the mother of harlots. A harlot is a prostitute, church, meaning a, a body of believers that is apostate. Denominationalism is how Protestants lost the Reformation, among other things, but it's one of them. Denominationalism is a product of the harlot because the harlot calls herself the Catholic Church, the universal church. That's the name that she puts herself, puts herself to it. But she's telling you she's the counterfeit because the true universal church is the church of every tribe and tongue that believes in Christ through election, through regeneration, through God's choice to save you from every tribe or tongue, whether you're Chinese or black or European or Indian or whatever else. That's the true universal church. Absolutely. But the counterfeit that boastly claims to be the Catholic church, the universal church, is the mother of harlots. And of course, her moniker is denominationalism, meaning that every denomination is a harlot. Even Seventh-day Adventists, sorry, my friends, I really hate to say it, but it's true. You have to realize that every denomination has something from the harlot. Seventh-day Adventism has a lot of things right about prophecy. They really do. I love my Seventh-day Adventist friends, like Walter Veith. He's got a ton of awesome lectures, a lot of great value there. But you believe in the investigative judgment. Why do you believe in that? Because you're Arminian in your salvation theology. And Arminianism, which is really a branch of synergism, is from the harlot. The Protestants rejected the sacramental system, but they did not reject the fundamental philosophical underpinning that made that system possible. This is why they failed. And they got other 
operatives like Jacobus Arminius in there to create oh, a Protestant version of synergism, which of course today is called Arminianism, and it's free will theology. That's from the beast. Most other churches worship on Sunday and rest on Sunday. That's from the beast. So many other things are from the beast, but ultimately denomination, the, the true way is the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6, which is on my website. Jesus says he's the way, and in the early church, people were called followers of the way. They were Christians. I'm a follower of Jesus. There's no denomination. And the problem is, of course, that non-denominational churches are a problem too. They're very lukewarm in their theology. Often they're seeker-sensitive or progressive. Or at the very least, they worship and rest on Sunday. So all of these things will be very easy to integrate. Because the denominationalism is the foundation for how all of this will be integrated. Sunday keeping, institutionalization, the Jesuit and Freemason spies in each institution, if you know anything about that. Like, for example, Billy Graham was a high-ranking Freemason. We've talk, I've talked about, uh, I forget what his name is now, but the guy who did the moral majority in the 80s. He was very likely a Jesuit operative, but he was a Protestant. Adam Weishaupt was a Protestant so-called, but he was a Jesuit-trained operative. Engels was a Protestant, quote-unquote. He's probably a Jesuit operative, so on and so forth. This is the use of spies that the art of war talks to you about and reveals to you. So if you understand that, then ecumenism is going to be easy. That's going to be one of the easier threads to integrate. Now, of course, you also have the New Age personal growth slash worldly pop Christianity movement. All of this is fusing into one reality. Again, I talked about life surge. That's like just prosperity gospel 2.0. Kingdom builders, NAR movement. All of these people have a fundamental spiritual reality. It doesn't matter what background they come from. The spiritual reality is charismatic. And it's a fusion of charismatic principles and charismatic experiences and giving up your body to these you know, lack of discernment, for better word, for lack of a better word, experiences fused with materialistic personal growth outcomes. You got to build the kingdom. Yeah, I'm a kingdom entrepreneur. I'm a kingdom millionaire. These types of things that are happening and they're very popular. It's all about prosperity and wealth. And it's just being marketed as a, as the new thing, as the Christian thing. If you remember like the emergent church in the early 2000s, that movement, it kind of fizzled out, but like Bono was heading it. And, you know, it was just this quasi, I don't even know, like they didn't want to have like a name, but it was obviously called the Emergent Church. They had a name for themselves. All the celebrities were on it. These things are waves. They do these, in, it failed, obviously it fizzled out, but they're doing it again. They're doing these through different people and different waves. Celebrity conversions, like I cover in my Jesuit Hollywood episode. All these things are part of the thing. Progressive Christianity, purpose-driven church, if you know what that is, new thought. I mean, if you attend like any modern church, all the sermons have turned gradually into personal growth seminars. They really have. They're taking from the personal growth industry. Of course, I did the personal growth industry for over a decade. I'm very versed in that department. And everything has turned into the same thing. It's this I don't know how to describe it to you. Like if you've ever gone to concerts, I used to go to a lot of raves back before I was saved and listen to a lot of EDM music. Hence, you can tell the music choice for this particular episode. But hey, I wanted something dramatic and like, you know, relevant. But nonetheless, if you've ever gone to like concerts and the way music is structured, it's designed to give you an emotional slash spiritual experience. It's got the beat and then it's got the build up, and then it's got the drop. These things are designed to take your consciousness through different levels and manipulate you into an emotion. Well, personal growth is fusing with that kind of music. Christianity is fusing with personal growth. It's all one thing that's just designed to get you to obey this counterfeit spirit. And of course, if you remember Daniel 2, very, I was literally just reading that last night. So again, God's timing is truly profound, how he does. Every time I'm committing to an episode, I al something always comes to my mind that I need to remember. And I was reading Daniel 2 last night, of all things that I could have been reading, about how the 
Nebuchadnezzar was enforcing worship with music. When you hear the sound of the this and that and the tambourines and the guitars and whatever else, that's when you bow down. And so music is very much going to be part of this new thing because music is tied to emotional experiences, charismatic revivals. It's this new thing. It's this new false light that is so intoxicating, like Bethel, Hillsong, all the NAR people that are associated to all these conventions, like the Great Awakening. There's a lot of NAR people there that are part of it. And of course, they're going to, oh, no, we're not Christian nationalists, but we know we know better by observing what they say, who they're associated with, and so on. They're all seven mountain mandate people. They're all dominionist people. Of course, if you know who sits on seven hills or seven mountains, you know where that mandate is from. But anyway, charismatic experiences are the universal glue for this particular thread. The new age, the personal growth, the worldly people, the worldly Christians. The charismatic thing is the glue. The question is why? Well, because the charismatic experience suspends your thinking. It suspends you from using doctrine. It suspends you from using the sort of truth. And that is the, that is the entire point. So as you go with emotion and intuition and going with the flow of things and not thinking, that is the glue that will glue all of these different denominations and creeds and people together is this charismatic thing. Watch my counterfeit episode in the End Time series. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about because there's a lot there. And the point is this. There's the focus on personal experience, on really relativism, if you think about it, intuition, dreams, visions, signs and wonders. This is all part of the counterfeit spirit. It's really as old as time. I cover this in my episode in the counterfeit spirit. But look, Kundalini, if you look at side by side, you look at these Charismatic revivals, especially the ones where they're doing deliverance and, you know, prosperity and all this kind of stuff. Side by side with Kundalini. There are videos on the internet about this. Literally side by side comparison, there's no difference. It is the same spirit. It's this loss of control, hysterically laughing, shaking. I mean, it's it's crazy. It really is. If you study the trajectory of these things, which I have in my episodes, Kundalini's practically ancient. I don't even know when Kundalini started, but thousands of years ago. Then you had hesychasm with the Orthodox in the 12th or 13th century, and they're still doing it. And of course, they learned that from a Catholic convert, which is very interesting. Then you had the 15th or 16th century, you had the Jesuit exercises, the spiritual exercises. All these things are, there's nothing new. In the 1800s, they had the Quakers and the Shakers, the charismatic movement <clears throat> with speaking in tongues and blah, 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 that all that insanity started happening. And then you had Vatican II and you had the Catholic charismatic renewal and basically, oh, now we're all friends. Look, our separated brethren, we have Catholic uh, charismatic experiences too. Maybe we should all unite. It's all the same false spirit. The Bible warned us about many false signs, false teachers, false teachings, false prophets, false wonders, all these things we were warned about. So the charismatic thing is a deception. I don't, I'm not a cessationist in the, in the thing, in the belief that there are gifts. There are still gifts. We all have gifts. Some people may have a gift for healing. I don't know. I don't deny the power of God to heal somebody, or I don't deny that there are demons that can possess people that people can be delivered from. But a Christian can, a born again Christian cannot be possessed. Otherwise you're denying the power of the Holy Spirit and saying that demons can push the Holy Spirit out of the way. Now, of course, charismatics, which is why another thread that has deceived people, which is why I'm going to start a series on this literally next week, or actually as the time of this episode, a couple days, but anyway, afterlife. What happens after we die? Do we have an immortal soul or not? The answer is no, we do not. We have contingent immortality. We wake up after we die, and the next thing we realize is we're being resurrected. Hopefully you have faith in Christ during your life so that when you're resurrected, you're resurrected to glory and not to shame. But nonetheless, because Protestants have been deceived by yet another lie from Babylon, that there's this immortal soul that persists, how does that tie into the charismatic movement? Well, it ties into it actually very interestingly because the charismatics use a division called the tripartite division, which is this thing that doesn't exist in the Bible. It's a pagan invention from the Greeks 
we have a mind, the soul, the spirit, the heart. You know, some people do four, some people do three. It doesn't matter. The, the Bible doesn't say you have a division between the heart, the mind, the soul, and the spirit. The Bible says you have a body and soul, and they're unified. You're a living soul, meaning you are a soul. You are a living soul. The moment you die, you that's it. But of course, you're going to be resurrected. The question is, are you going to be resurrected to glory or to shame? It's like sleeping. Do you remember? I mean, sometimes you have a dream, but let's say on nights that you don't remember, do you remember when you fell asleep? You don't. You just go to sleep, and then the next thing you know, you're awake, and time has passed. That's a picture of death. But again, if you're deceived on the afterlife, which is one of the many lies that Rome has peddled, that allows you to believe things like the charismatic teaching that, oh, Christians can have a demon. You never know. Well, wait a minute. I thought that if you're a born-again Christian, you can't be possessed by a demon. No, no, you're not being possessed. It's really the demon is affecting your soul. It's not affecting your spirit. Oh, okay. So you see how that they let that in through that false teaching? This is the problem. And if you study charismatic quackery long enough, you realize that it's just legalism. It really is just legalism hiding behind emotional experiences. Because there's people like Isaiah Saldivar who teach that you need to be delivered every month. You need to have deliverance sessions. You need to do this. You need that. It's legalism. It is straight up legalism. It's crazy. But they're the new Pharisees. Anyway, the charismatic thing is as old as time. And it will manifest in the coming months and years and that's something we need to be watching, is this charismatic takeover. Now, let's talk about secular or atheists or non-religious people or agnostics. And the thread for that is climate change. Very simply. Climate change is center stage and it's being used to unite the world to rest on Sunday. It's going to bring secular people into the pattern of resting and honoring Sunday. And it's going to help shape culture to seduce them into the new thing. Of course, there will eventually be a religious connotation to Sunday because the image of the beast will be exported to the rest of the world. And that means a Christian nationalist thing where there's no separation between church and state. So the Sunday thing will be eventually a religious thing because they're going to have propaganda like crazy. Look at the propaganda that's now with all these movies and apps and you know, news covering various things. You have, you know, these various Catholic authorities going on TikTok and saying, hey, here's how you can get over depression. Oh my gosh, do, do this, do that. Oh, by the way, pray the rosary with me. They're doing stuff like this constantly. It's going to only ramp up. So don't worry, the atheists will convert. Even in fact, I recently saw a video about, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting his name. He's a famous atheist. But uh, anyway, I'll put him on the screen. He's a famous atheist. I'm not remembering his name. But he recently was interviewed and he was like, oh, I'm a cultural Christian. I love. I don't believe anything about Christianity, but I love, you know, my cathedrals and I love little Easter celebrations and things like that. And it just goes to show you, like, that is the epitome example of how this is going to happen from dark to light. The atheists will come along. Don't worry. The future is not atheist, folks. They will be integrated into the new thing. Even if they don't believe, it doesn't matter. You're going to honor Sunday as the day of rest. Remember, the mark of the beast is either on the hand or on the head. The head relates to you believing in it, which will be the hardcore Christian nationalist. Then there's going to be the people who are just doing it, like the atheist guy that I can't remember his name right now. Dang it. But anyway, like him and like many others who are just doing it, they don't really believe, but they're doing it to get the benefits and not to be ostracized because, you know, why would you do that? So climate change will help to prep the secular, liberal, woke, agnostic, you know, atheistic, non-religious, whatever crowd and bring them into the new thing. Of course, it's also going to serve the purpose for all the other threads I just mentioned because people, there's a lot of people in the new age and personal growth in other churches that are, you know, Muslim or whatever else that believe in climate change. So climate change is not exclusively for atheists, but it will rope in the atheists as well. So what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is that all of these people, these vastly different, seemingly different narratives are being woven into one culture, one mindset, one reality, which ultimately is going to lead to the mark of the beast, which is Sunday rest. 
Zionism and Islam are the ones that are dependent on mutual conflict with one another, which is why there's a conflict in the Middle East and which is why that will be resolved. The question is how far are they going to push it? But remember that the Bible warns you of a Christian nationalist counterfeit system, not an Islamic system, not a communist system, not a Jewish Zionist takeover, but a counterfeit Christian power. So that's the seven, was it seven threads, six threads, something like that. That's the threads. All roads lead to Rome. Remember that. And now on to the next part, which is, will there be a counterfeit second coming? Okay, so now we got to talk about something that is very important, which is exploring the possibility that they might counterfeit the return of Christ. I've talked about this idea in many episodes. In general, I've hinted at it. I've just kind of mentioned it. But in this particular part, we're going to get really deep and look at all the evidence. There is evidence that suggests that they might do it. There's also evidence that suggests that this will not happen. Our goal today will be to look at both and see what is reasonable, but pre, but be prepared either way. That's my goal. I'm not here to tell you what's going to happen in this particular regard, whether there's going to be a false return or not. I'm here to give you the evidence from the Bible and from history so that you are prepared either way. That's the point. I don't know. I think it's a possibility, so I'm just telling you up front that I do think it's a possibility. Now, let's look at the evidence for the counterfeit return. In the didac, which by the way, people who are correcting me on the pronunciation of didac and telling me that it's pronounced didache, it's not pronounced didache. And I'll tell you why, because I was a linguistics major in English in, uh, in college. And I'm not saying that to puff myself up, but I learned the value of pronunciation and vocal formation of vowels and sounds. In English, there is something called a diphthong vowel, like uh or D, D, like the I in didache in English doesn't exist in most languages. That is a thing that is unique to English because most languages have pure vowels. I, didache, that would be the pronunciation of that word. But the question is, can you pronounce that in English given how it's spelled? Well, no, you can't. Just like how the Greeks translated Yehoshua or Yoshua to Jesus in Greek, because you couldn't pronounce Yeshua in Greek. So they said Jesus. And you can't pronounce Jesus in English, so we said Jesus. So transliteration of words, whenever you transliterate a word, you have to realize that it's not going to be pronounced the same way. So when I say didac, it's actually based on the, the grammatical rules of English, making the I a longer vowel because of the the vowels following it. So it's not didache, because d doesn't exist in English. I is not a vowel that we can pronounce in English, or at least not based on the constraints of the way the word is formed in this particular case. So didac remains. But anyway, that was a tangent. Just thought I'd respond to that. This is the didac, early Christian fathers. And if you can look, look it up, I believe it's in chapter eight. Let's see here, chapter somewhere at the end. Okay, lost my spot. I didn't highlight it apparently, so here it is. This is 16, verse 16 in the Didache, 179, line 179. It says this, For with the increase of iniquity, men will hate, persecute, and betray each other. And then the world deceiver, i.e. Satan, will appear in the guise of God's Son. He will work signs and wonders, and the earth will fall into his hands, and he will commit outrages such as have never occurred before. This document is not inspired by scripture, or is not inscribed, inspired by the Holy Spirit. However, it's a historical document that was very early in the church. Early hundreds, second century. Meaning that very early on Christians believed, it's a legitimate belief to believe that the devil will counterfeit the return of Christ. That was a legitimate belief, and that's been around for almost 2,000 years. So, if you believe that, if you think that that might happen, it's a legitimate belief. A lot of Christians believe that. 
So that's important to understand. Very, It's a very early text. Now, in Matthew 24, um, there's a lot of false Christ mentioned. This is Matthew 24, verse 23 through 27. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray even possible, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Now he says again about this false Christ. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Which, again, that's something that they will not be able to counterfeit. They will not be able to counterfeit, very important, us meeting Jesus in the air. Just remember that. We're going to come back to that in just a second. But Jesus warns about false Christ, and he seems to, to again, warn about a particular false Christ. It seems that way when he reiterates his point, like, listen, if they say to you he's there or here, don't believe it. There's a lot of incidents of false Christ in the last century, especially like if you know Apollo Quibbeloy, the Australian guy named AJ, who his wife is supposedly named Mary Magdalene. I mean, he, they named themselves that, but he's very popular. There's a guy named Yesu in Kenya who has like a million followers. These people are very influential and they literally call themselves Jesus Christ on earth. So this is definitely fulfilling Christ's words and certainly more so than ever, which again is another time marker that we're at the end, at the end of the end. And the important thing to note is that Christ says the deception would fool the elect even if it were possible. Well, to me, Apollo Quibbeloy, AJ, this guy in Yesu, these people are obviously counterfeits. So that's like you don't see like genuine Christians being fooled by these people at least not most of the time. So that's an important point because even though these are false Christs and they are fulfilling his words, they are not working signs and wonders to fool even the elect if possible. I mean, I don't know. It seems to me that this seems, suggests that there's something more that needs to be fulfilled. I could be wrong, but again, let's look at all the evidence. There's also a false Christ that people point to in 2 Thessalonians. Two, with the man of lawlessness. This is 1 through 12. Let's read it. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or spoken word or letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So far, hopefully you know who that is. Do you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way, i.e. pagan Rome. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Thank you, loud truck. The coming of the lawless one is by the act. Now up to here, this is, this is the point. Up to here, very easy to exegete that this is about the papal institution. And I have a whole episode on that. I have countless episodes on that. But very clear that this is talking about the Pope as the one who sat in the temple and proclaimed himself to be God. But now... This is where people begin to argue that maybe this also has a fulfillment in a false Christ. Verse 9, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they might believe what is false, in order that they may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So this seems to be like the last couple verses seem to suggest that this is now like an extra fulfillment of this, that, that is reaching its final fulfillment in a false Christ possibly because of various things like the signs and wonders, the strong delusion, and so on. In Acts 2 verse 22, the signs and wonders and miracles are applied to Jesus. 
Men of Israel, hear these words. I believe this is, what is it, Peter? Yeah. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So the mighty works and wonders and signs are attributed to Christ. Of course, if you're going to counterfeit Christ, you're going to do false miracles. So that's an interesting parallel because the language seems to parallel these two places to suggest a false Christ. Now, another thing that's important is that the word for that people use, I'm saying, which is important to consider, is the word for coming, um, let's see, the coming of our Lord. Okay, so verse 1 where it says the coming of our Lord, the word there is parousia. Okay, now if we go to the coming of the lawless one in the verse 9, and we look at even him who's coming, parousia. So the word parousia is used for both the coming of the Lord and the coming of the lawless one, which is an interesting parallel. And when it says the strong, when God will send them a strong delusion in verse 11, the original language actually has, I don't think it'll show it here, but the original language has the definite article, meaning the lie. So again, all these things seem to be pointing to a specific thing that will unfold on top of this already counterfeit power, which we know is the Pope and the papal institution. Now, another point, so keep all these things in mind. We're going to address and integrate them as we go on. But another point is the third temple narrative, which we talked about in the previous two parts. The Jews always wanted supernatural signs. This is one of the reasons they stumbled over the gospel. It was too simple. They couldn't possibly believe that the Savior had to be crucified by the pagan power. So they stumbled over that. It was too humbling for them. They lusted for a conquering Messiah. The Muslims are very superstitious as well. They believe in Jesus and believe he'll return with the Mahdi to destroy the Dajjal, which the Dajjal is the Jewish Messiah. The Jews are expecting a false Messiah, or I should say they're expecting a real Messiah to them. But we know that the Yanaka, this guy who's doing healings and miracles, little prodigy that's walking around, it's a rabbi. We know that this guy's a false Messiah and he's being guided by the counterfeit spirit. So let's say, hypothetically, the Yanaka walks into the temple that's rebuilt after whatever, how many years, and proclaims itself to be God. This triggers a massive war in the Middle East. And of course, the Muslims believe now they have to eradicate this Antichrist so that the Mahdi can show up and save them. This triggers just everything to blow up. And of course, people are expecting a futurist eschatology, meaning everything centered around Jerusalem. So the, the Middle East is going to center around Jerusalem. And then suddenly, let's say, Lucifer shows up in a supernatural way. The media is covering it like crazy, telling you that, you know, every eye will see him. Of course, if you know the truth about cosmology, you'll know what that statement actually means, why every eye will see him. But if you believe the heliocentric lie, which Mystery of Babylon created, then they will fulfill that to you by saying every eye will see him on the media. And you'll see these maybe holographic projections. Maybe you might see some supernatural things. Either way, let's say Lucifer shows up, destroys this Yanaka. The Muslims are converted. Israel has a revival and believes in Jesus, in the false Jesus, because they finally accept their Messiah with supernatural signs. And everything is integrated. The Muslims convert because they're told the truth by this false Jesus and because he destroyed the Dajjal, so he did something good in their eyes. The Jews convert because they wanted supernatural signs and their false Messiah was destroyed by, quote unquote, the real Messiah. The Christians are already expecting some sort of future millennial golden age and all this Jewish stuff to happen, so they're going to be an easy sell. And the non-Christians are believe in a future golden age anyway, and of course they're going to be swayed by supernatural signs. So all of this is going to integrate everybody if it, if it does happen, which is really phenomenal. A false Christ will implement the millennial kingdom at that point, because in Psalm 110 verse 2, it says, the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule amidst your enemies. Now, of course, if you know the true nature of the millennial kingdom, 
being right now, i.e. the time that Christ is ruling from heaven spiritually before he returns, then you realize that this is a total deception. So if a millennial kingdom is being in, you know, initiated or inaugurated, whatever, then guess what's going to happen? Well, the people who are objecting to this system and see the truth are the enemies that need to be put under his feet. Do you get the point? You're going to be the enemy that needs to be put under his feet by rejecting this false Christ and rejecting possibly his false day of worship, which will be Sunday. So this is kind of the general picture of the evidence that points to a false Christ happening. I think it's enough evidence to where it could very well be a possibility. It could very well be something that will happen. Now, let's look at evidence against the counterfeit return. First off, let's look at the book of Revelation. Revelation 17, the final iteration of this system that Daniel and John see, this Antichrist system, the final iteration talks about the kings of the earth giving their power to the Catholic Church. The woman riding the beast is not a person. It is the Catholic system, just like they did in history for over 1,400 years. Revelation 13, the beast that rules for 1,260 years and comes back and is worshipped is not a person. It's a system. It's a systemic antichrist. The image in Revelation 13 is the one who enforces the mark, not a person. So the teaching that a false Christ will appear and enforce a Sunday day of worship is not true because it's the image that enforces the mark of the beast. Do you get the point? That's a very important point. Now in Revelation 15 through 17, it tells us exactly that. This is chapter 13. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, and rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. We've talked about what the mark of the beast is so many times, but it's the image that is the one who is doing the dirty work, meaning the system, again, it's a system that is enforcing the mark, that is causing the mark, that is you know, putting it into society, so it's not a person. So that's very important because Revelation itself, the book of Revelation, does not point you to a personal antichrist, doesn't point you to a false return of Christ. It just says that there will be a systemic antichrist that will basically enforce obedience and, and worship just like it did for many, many centuries. Now, the book of Daniel also has some things to say. The little horn power in Daniel 8, verse 25, it says something very telling. It says, by his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and, his, and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. Now, this is an important string of words. It's a very important string of words. The language here, anytime you see parallels of language, like we did with the seven seals, bulls, and trumpets, that's significant. It's done intentionally. When it says, by no human hand, this relates to earlier in Daniel, where the vision of the statue happened. Verse 45, just as you saw that stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. It broke it by no, by no human hand. See the point? was cut from a mountain by no human hand, meaning there's a relationship between what Daniel saw in Daniel 2 and the visions in Daniel 8. This is why you have to be consistent. Of course, Daniel 8 doesn't talk about all the empires. It just talks about the Persians and the Greeks and what happens after Greece, and then it skips into, I should say, what happens after Alexander the Great, and then it skips Rome and it goes straight to the little horn power. But it's the same little horn. But that little horn is a systemic institution. It's a, of course, it has a personal representative, which is the Pope. And Paul makes that clear to you in 2 Thessalonians. But nonetheless, it's a systemic antichrist. And that antichrist power rules until the end. That is the power that is destroyed by no human hand. 
So that means that there is no other power or other more evil thing that's happening beyond this one. Does that make sense? So it doesn't point you to a false Christ. It says there's a systemic power. Now, back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If we go back to verse 8 and 9, where I said that the people who argue that there's a false Christ in here being painted, that especially with verse 9, with it says the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. Well, like I said, up until verse 8, it's very clear that we're talking about the Pope. Very easy to, to pinpoint that. And the person that's listed as the lawless one in verse 8 is the same as the one in verse 9. So obviously, it's not just shifting gears from suddenly talking about the Pope to suddenly talking about the false Christ that would be on the horizon. Very clear that this is talking about a succession of people. And one easy proof for that is that in 2 Timothy 3 verse 17, actually 16 and 17, Paul says this, all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Now, is this talking about a particular man in the future? The answer is no, it's not. It's talking about an archetype. Do you get the point? The archetype is the man of God, the person who is faithful, who believes in God, who wants to get to know God, who wants to do his will, who's studying to show himself approved. That man of God, which are many, that is the man of God being spoken of here. Well, of course, when you go back to 2 Thessalonians, the lawless one, it's not talking about one single individual in the future, it's talking about a succession of individuals. And even Adventists will agree with this. So the question is, why would it change from talking about an archetype, a succession of people, to suddenly a false Christ? It wouldn't. You have to use const consistent hermeneutics, which is very important. Remember that the devil the devil is limited by the Genesis curse. He do, the People don't live forever. He doesn't have somebody that he can just inhabit and then just rule forever. So that's why he gave his power to this system so that he could have a man that he could work through over and over. The papal institution, you are as close to Satan as you can get because you are his representative. Of course, you're parading around as Christ's representative, but we know that the angel, uh, that the devil appears as an angel of light. So that's something to consider that the, a, a, con, a consistent use of the right hermeneutic shows that 2 Thessalonians is not talking about a future false Christ, but really it's just this papal power. Now, to respond to this point about parousia, because people will say, well, see, the coming of the lawless one and the coming of Lord, they both use the word parousia. Well, if you look at the usage of that word, it's not exclusively used for the return of Christ. That's something important. Philippians 2 verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed now, so not only as in my presence... The word here is parousia. Let's see if it has it. Yeah, parousia, you see? So in this case, it's talking about Paul's presence. It's not talking about the second coming of Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 17. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanas. Coming here is parousia. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 6. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. This is parousia of Titus. So Titus came and comforted them. And the word here is parousia. Obviously, not, it's not talking about the second coming of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak. Presence is parousia. And his speech of no account. So what's the point? Well, it's not exclusively, the word parousia is not exclusively used for the coming of Jesus. If it was, that would be something interesting. If the only two times that that was used was, for example, in Thessalonians 2 about Christ, and then suddenly it's used for this lawless one, there would be a greater case. But as it is, there isn't. Parousia can just mean somebody coming. So that takes away from the theory that law, the th Second Thessalonians 2 is talking about the false Christ. Now, another point to make is on Satan's release, which is going to be a part I'm going to expand on in the next part of this, because it's a very fascinating thing to discuss. But Satan is released after the mark. After the mark goes live, he's released. 
If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll expand upon it in the next section. It has to do with Revelation 20, which is the release of Satan after the period of the quote-unquote thousand years. There's a release there, and there's a lot of confusion on this, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't really understand it fully until very recently. So I thank God for that. I do feel that I understand it much better now. So hopefully I'll be able to convey that to you. But nonetheless, Satan is released after the mark goes live. Why is that important? Well, once the mark is implemented and enforced, the elect are sealed, meaning there's a point in time where, now we don't know when this point is, but there is a point that God has determined where there, there's no more elect that need to be saved. Everybody has come to salvation. It's now time for the final hours and enduring persecution and so, so on and so forth, the bold judgments and so on. I believe that this point of sealing, which the Bible mentions in Revelation 7 and 14, will determine the beginning of the bold judgments. Make sense? Because there's no judgment, there's no condemnation for the elect. We don't get judged. We'll be protected, the ones who are left alive. Thank you, motorcycle. We'll be protected, and we're not going to be victims of the bold judgments. But that means that, that once, the ju once the bold judgment roll out, the elect have been sealed. There's no more people that need to come to Christ. Everybody else has been solidified in rebellion. So that's very important, because if Satan is going to counterfeit God's Jesus' return to implement the mark of the beast, it doesn't line up with the timeline of Revelation 20. Does that make sense? It'll make sense hopefully in the next part as well. But for Satan to counterfeit the return of Christ so that he can implement the mark of the beast, for example, through a millennial reign, Sunday worship type of situation, doesn't make sense because Satan is released after the mark of the beast. You'll learn what I mean. The bulls begin with the mark of the beast. Remember, the people who get judged first are the ones who take the, the mark, meaning the bulls don't happen until the mark has been enforced and all the believers have been sealed. Well, by the sixth bull, you'll see that that aligns with Satan's release. So Satan's re release is after the mark of the beast has already been well into being enforced. Because Satan has a, Satan's release has a very specific purpose, which we'll talk about in the next section. So that also doesn't align with this narrative that there may be a false Christ. So, conclusions. Let's put this all together now. Currently, I don't believe that there will actually be a supernatural impersonation of Christ on earth by Satan. I don't believe that. However, and it's, this is a huge however, do not take what I just said and say, oh, okay, that's it. I'm turning it off. However, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I am remaining open and it's important to be pre fully prepared if that happens. Very, very important. Remember that the Bible says that we'll meet Christ in the air. This is in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is not about a rapture. This is when Jesus actually returns. The people who are left alive will be raised into the air. So there's no way that can be counterfeited, which is, I'm sure, why, part of the reason why Jesus decided to do that. But unless you meet, unless you meet Christ in the air, then there is, there's nothing there. It's a, it's a counterfeit that's happening. Whatever you're seeing on the news, on your phone, oh my gosh, look, Jesus is here. Look at all these supernatural signs. If you're not being lifted into the air, then it's not the real deal, regardless of how crazy it seems. Unless the mark of the beast has already been enforced, any second coming is false. That's an important thing to also remember. So if they try to have a second coming and the mark of the beast has not been enforced yet. People are not going to prison, getting tribunals persecuted and executed. That second coming is false. That's something to know. Again, this, the mark of the beast, the evil thing that everybody's afraid of is the thing to watch and leverage your hope against. Because as that gets worse, our hope gets greater. But now, the asterisk. My guess is if they, if they were going to try something, they will use holograms, deception, who knows what, to create some sort of false revival using the things that I explained. The Middle East is a powder keg. The whole Third Temple situation has got to go somewhere. Once they start building that temple, there is no like neutral way out of it. 
Do you get my point? They're committed to this. The question is, how far are they willing to push it? Are they going to use it to bring world peace through a dialectic? Are they going to use it to create a charismatic revival so that the Jews can be sucked into this new Christian nationalist thing? Are they going to go so far as to create a counterfeit return of Jesus? I don't know. Those are the three possibilities, the main ones. And that's something we'll have to watch. So when you're watching Israel, stop watching dispensationalists, but watch and see you know, what happens in the things that I just described, because my guess is if they are going to do something, they will use holograms and all kinds of deception, lying signs and wonders. I mean, look at the holograms, the people that we have available today. It's crazy. I mean, they've been practicing this stuff for a while. And when they let it loose, I'm sure a lot of people will be deceived. So that's it for part six. Now let's talk about Satan's release. All right. Well, in this part, I want to look at a very important nuance in Revelation 20 having to do with Satan's release, which I think has caused a lot of confusion for a lot of people, and including myself. It really was kind of like a missing link or a missing piece in my end times pre presentation. And in this particular video, I want to clarify that for you and really discuss it in depth. I have discussed it many times, and recently I... For one reason or another, I guess I kind of just saw something differently, and I think that it'll be very edifying. What is more important than understanding when Satan is released is realizing that Satan was bound and when he was bound and what is the nature of his binding. That is my third episode, I believe, in the End Time series, because a lot of people are fooled by premillennialism. And premillennialism, pre -millennialism, one of the pillars of it is that Satan has to be bound in the future. So that's why I never really focused on Satan's release because it wasn't really an issue for me. In fact, one of the reasons why I used to be premillennial, most people are, one of the reasons I couldn't get around to accepting it fully was why would Satan be released again? After a thousand years of a golden age with Christ ruling on earth, why would Satan be released? This makes no sense. And so that pushed me to more of an amillennial position, but I'm not an amillennial because amillennialism has gone way off the deep end with spiritual, over-spiritualizing things. I am a historicist amillennial, if I were to label myself. I don't like labels, but if I were to label my position, it would be historicist amillennial. I believe the millennium is now. I think it's very clear based on all the evidence, and I interpret Bible prophecy historically. So there are some overlaps there, obviously, with Seventh-day Adventism, because they're historicists. They're one of the last few people that are. But Seventh-day Adventists, ironically, are premillennials. So there's a lot of fancy theories about Satan being, you know, locked up when people are in heaven for a thousand years, and Satan's got to think about his choices for a thousand years, and all these fairy tales that really don't help you discern the truth. So the more important thing was always whether Satan was bound and... I talk about that in my end time series. Of course, he's been bound. That doesn't mean Satan's activity has been stopped. It means his ability as a principality to thwart God's intentions, like the gospel, like election, like, you know, everything that's going to happen with Bible prophecy, his power has been thwarted. It's been done away with. Christ is the one who has the keys to death and Hades now. The devil was the god of death before that. And he used death to obtain worship. So he's been bound spiritually, but certainly his activity has not ceased at all. In fact, it's increased because time is running short. So if you understand the nature of Satan being bound, that is much more important. That's my caveat. But I never focused on Satan's release because it wasn't really central to anything. It was either going to happen in the future or it's already happened, which in the case, if it did happen, what's the big deal? I mean, look at history. We've always lived under a kingdom of darkness, and I never really saw a major importance to it. However, I've realized some things in the last couple of weeks and months, and I decided to put them together in this episode to give you a fuller picture of this, because I think it can be helpful, especially in the topic that we're talking about, which is the timeline of the end. So 
Where does this come from? Well, it comes from Revelation 20. So let's read Revelation 20, the thousand years. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that, the, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. This is a very important reason as to why he was bound. Until the thousand years were ended. Okay, so there's a specific purpose. After that, he must be released for a little while. The question is, when is that release and how long is it? I used to think it was a lot longer, but now my idea is that it is actually very short. But moving on. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those who were given the authority to judge, were committed. Also, I saw souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads and their hands. This is an important timestamp that John is, so keep that in mind. It's a very important timestamp. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Now, this this chapter, I'm just saying right now, if you haven't watched my end time series, like especially the one on uh, episode 20, or Revelation 20, Decoding Revelation 20. I think it's episode 7 or 8 or something. This ep- this chapter is notoriously misinterpreted. It's notoriously complicated. It doesn't have to be if you're using sound principles, but it is, it is a little more cryptic than most things that you read in the Bible. So just letting you know. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Such Over such the second death has no power. But the... They will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. The defeat of, of Satan. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they reached and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who, was, who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. They were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, one immediate clue that you have from here, and we'll talk about a lot of these as we go on, is that the beast and the false prophet are systems. So obviously, this is all figurative. To get the point, the beast and the false prophet are not individuals that are burning in the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the ultimate, it will exist, believe me, the lake of fire is true. That's why there is no immortal soul that goes to hell right now. The hell hell is a future place of final judgment where God will delete you from the game. But nonetheless, it'll be, it'll be a very painful deletion, but you will be deleted. And so will the devil and so will this antichrist system. The lake of fire represents this, it will be a real lake of fire, but it also represents judgment the final judgment. The beast and the false prophet are systems, meaning that this is all figurative because they're not literally taking a beast and a false prophet and throwing them into the lake of fire. Do you see the point? So that's very important. Now, a big error that most people make is that they believe that the thousand years in this chapter is literal. And of course, I address this in my series because one of the things is that the word for the Greek there, kilioi, or however it's pronounced, kilia, is actually an indefinite plural, meaning it is suggestive of many, many years. It's not saying literally a thousand years. So there's a whole study on that that you can look into. But nonetheless, that's the error that most people make. But if you realize that the millennium is spiritual and Christ is ruling right now, because he has to be, Christ is ruling, Christ is king, And in order for him to be priest, he has to also be king at the same time. We go into this in my series. Now, this leads to a problem for people who are premillennials because they believe the crisis is coming in the future. So you see how it leads you into error by believing that this is a literal reign in the future? It leads you to believe that Christ is not king, which, of course, is a real problem in your belief system. So, but now there's also an error for people who believe 
the amillennial position that Christ is ruling right now. There's also the danger for an error right now in, in believing that. And, that. and this is how it shapes up to be. People who believe that the millennium is spiritual, which it's true, the millennium is right now, they believe that Christ started his ruling at the ascension because that's when he fulfilled the vision of Daniel 7 of the Son of Man going before the Ancient of Days, receiving dominion, all these types of things. That was fulfilled at the ascension when Christ ascended back into heaven and was received with glory and basically sat down at the right hand of the Father and took dominion. So that would be like an official starting point of the millennial reign for Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 through 26, though, Paul says that when Jesus returns, he does so to basically finish this reign. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to the God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Do you see how this refutes premillennialism and dispensationalism? When Jesus returns, the resurrection happens. We who are alive will meet the, the Lord in the air along with those who are being resurrected. Meaning death is destroyed when Jesus arrives. Meaning if that's the last enemy to be destroyed, then Jesus is coming to end the millennial reign and give the kingdom back to God the Father. Now, there is a very interesting study on this exact verse that I go into uh, in my Trinity series where we talk about triune monarchy. Now, if you don't know what that means, it just means basically that at the end of time, Yahweh, the triune God, will rule through the body of Christ. And it's a mystery, but there is a shift that the Bible seems to show us between the time that Christ is ruling. Christ is the human body, the chosen human vessel that God chose to manifest as. When Jesus came to the earth, it was the son of the three persons that was in Christ. Of course, there's no. this is a mystery we're dealing with here, folks. So you can't be, you know, cut and dry with these things and, and separate God in chunks. But nonetheless, Yahweh entered reality through the son in Jesus. What 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24 is alluding to or pointing to is that there is a shift in the Godhead in the sense that creation will be renewed, the Holy Spirit will be in everyone, there's no more evil, and God will be all in all, i.e. the triune God will be fully manifest through the body of Christ in glorious form. Meaning when you look at Jesus, you will see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all in one person. That is the thing that is, this is all boiling down to. And that's a profound study. I encourage you to check it out. It's in my Trinity series. But nonetheless, the, the tangent, that was a tangent. The point is that when Jesus returns, he's coming to end the millennial kingdom. Very clearly so. So, this is a real problem. And if you haven't spotted it yet, then the problem is that how can Satan be released after the thousand years is over if the thousand years equals the millennial rule of Christ. Do you get the point? If we are attributing this thousand years as people who are amillennial, essentially, and saying, well, this is really just figuratively a period of time where Christ is ruling. Okay, that seems to make sense. Uh, except one problem. Satan has to be released after this period of time. Well, that doesn't work because Jesus returns. He returns to give the kingdom back to the Father and the last enemy to be destroyed is death, meaning the kingdom is over when Jesus returns. The millennial reign is ending when Jesus return, when he returns to the earth, meaning there's no time for Satan to be released. So this is a problem for all millennials and people who believe in the spiritual meaning of the millennium, which is true. It is true. So the question is, how can Satan be released? If he, if he comes after the millennial reign and the millennial reign is equal to the thousand years. This is a major weakness of the amillennial perspective. But today we're going to solve it. 
As I personally considered this situation, I realized a very important thing. The thousand years listed in Revelation 20 is not referring to Christ's millennial reign. This is going to be a profound thing. I have a little graphic I'll show you. But if you can make a distinction between the thousand years that are listed in Revelation 20 and the millennial reign where Christ is actually ruling while his enemies are being put under his feet, that is going to solve this problem. It's referring, the thousand years now in Revelation 20 is referring to a specific period of time that intersects with Christ ruling from heaven, but it's from the believer's perspective. It is a period of time where the believers are reigning with Christ. And of course, I talk about what it means to reign. It means to conquer through faith, just like Christ conquered death through faith in God. Till the very end, he endured. The people who are martyred, who are persecuted, who are faithful to the end, they will conquer with Christ. That is what this is talking about. But it's talking about from the perspective of the believers. It's referring to a specific period of time. Now, I want to bring your attention back to that timestamp that I told you to remember, Revelation 20, verse 4. Um, then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. So he's seeing two groups of people that are coming to life in this particular period of time. Now, there's an importance to that, that there's nothing wasted in the Bible. And the importance is that this is a timestamp of the church age, of the persecuting time where in the Roman Empire, what did you have? The first types of persecutions were beheadings. In fact, beheading was actually a merciful persecution because it was a quick death. But either way, beheadings characterized the first wave of Christian persecution in the early church. What is the last persecution that the people will, will face? Well, it's the mark of the beast who didn't take the mark and eventually will be persecuted for it. Do you see the point? So ultimately, this is time stamping this period of time of a thousand years, which again, it's not literally a thousand years. It's a long period of time that describes from the believer's perspective, this period of time that believers will conquer through Christ. This is It's the optimistic message coming among all of the evil that's being shown to you, that you will conquer through Christ if you endure. Well, who's going to conquer? From the very first people to the very last people on earth. Do you get the point? It is from the believer's perspective. And of course, reigning with Christ is spiritual. It's not talking about some souls going to heaven and ruling on chairs with Christ or anything like that. But if you've bought the lie on that, which is a Catholic lie, then it's easy to believe all sorts of fairy tales. And this is the problem, how the devil has confused all of these prophecies. It's not saying Christ is ruling for a thousand years. It's saying they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Do you get the point? Christ could be ruling longer. It's the believers who are highlighted to you and saying, okay, they're going to be ruling with Christ for a particular period of time. And again, even that period of time is not specific. It's just a long period of time that they're ruling with Christ, meaning the church age. But what if Christ ruling while his enemies are being put under his feet is slightly longer than this period of time? This is the thing to keep in mind. The thousand years in Revelation 20 is not the millennial reign of Christ. It's not. It is a period of time that intersects with the millennial reign of Christ. And this is the problem. So now if we look at this graphic, oh, if I can find it here, here it is. All right. Okay. So this is the graphic. Now this is a timeline. And basically you have a couple of very important markers. The Ascension and the Pentecost happened very close to one another. So we can basically say that they're about the same beginning. Pentecost happened, I believe, 10 days after the Ascension. So if Jesus fulfilled Daniel 7 when he ascended, took dominion, the millennial reign begins, he's ruling from heaven while his enemies are being put under his feet, 
i.e. Bible prophecies being fulfilled. Pentecost happened a couple days after that. That's when the church officially began. The Holy Spirit came, people became born again, people converted. That's when the church age began. Well, you have two things that are running parallel side by side, which a lot of people, I don't think really anybody that I've seen, makes this distinction. You have the actual ruling of Christ while he's ruling in heaven with absolute sovereignty. He's ruling while his enemies are being put under his feet. Let's see if I can zoom just a little bit in. Um, okay, that doesn't do it. Okay, anyway, that's another image. But I can't zoom in. Let's see. Maybe I can. Yes, I can. Yeah, 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 I can zoom in, but it won't let me scroll. Yes, it will. Okay, there it is. I just want you to see it better. Okay. Pentecost is when the church began, which was a little bit after the ascension. So it's a shorter period of time. Keep that in mind. The ascension is when Christ's rule officially began because he fulfilled the vision in Daniel 7. Now, these two things are running parallel side by side. There's one on earth, which is the millennial saints. From our perspective, we're being persecuted. The beast, the woman is running away for 1260 days, you know, all those things that are happening, the, the seven phases of the church, the seals, the trumpets. There's a lot happening on earth that is being revealed to you. While this is happening, John is telling you that from the very beginning to the very end of the persecution, everybody who endures will conquer in Christ. So this is the millennial saints ruling, meaning millennial being just this period of time until Christ returns, which is highlighted, by the way, between when the church began and people started getting beheaded and persecuted to the very end. Remember, there's a point in time when the believers of the elect will be sealed, meaning there's no more elect to be coming to faith. Does that make sense? There's going to be a time when there's no more people that need to be saved. That's like the critical hour. Probably, my guess, is when the bold judgments will start. And because, again, if you read the bold judgment, it says nobody repented, meaning the bold judgments aren't designed to, okay, come on, guys, it's the 11th hour. If you still haven't believed, you know, cross on over. I don't think that's the case. It's very clear that people were cursing God and being unrepentant with the bold judgments, meaning that the elect are sealed, just like it tells you. There's The number is reached, it's fullness, and then the persecution is ramping up, and then the bold judgments drop. So that point in time where the people who need to come to Christ is fulfilled intersects with the mark of the beast, meaning that from our perspective, if we go to this chart again, the mark of the beast is really the ending of this period of time that is our perspective, that we're ruling with Christ. Does that make sense? Because we're, we're being highlighted from one point of persecution to another. But Christ is still ruling even while this is happening. While the bowl judgments are happening, he's still in heaven ruling. He doesn't come until the seventh bowl. Does that make sense? So now, after the elect have been sealed, and the mark of the beast is reaching its critical, let's say, you know, red alert status, and the bowls start dropping, well, it tells you in Revelation, we're going to look at it in just a second, that on the sixth bowl, Satan is released. So Satan is released after people have been sealed, there's no more people to save. The bold judgments have been starting to drop. Towards the very end, Satan is actually released. In the period of time between this final moment where there's no more people to save and the actual return of Jesus is the little season that Satan, or the little while that Satan is released. This is what it is, because there are two parallel systems there's a heavenly one of Christ ruling until the very moment that he comes back to return the kingdom back to the Father. And from our perspective, which is this long period of time that intersects, most of it does. I mean, if you look at this, most of it intersects with Christ's rule. And we're ruling with him. We're conquering through Christ. But it's shorter. And it's shorter for a very good reason, because there's a point in time when the mark of the beast, there would be no more people to save. It'll go critical, people start getting executed, and of course, people need to be left alive. So that's when the bold judgments will start dropping, and eventually Satan will be released for a very specific purpose, to rally the nations together to fight against Christ, which we'll look at in just a second. 
he eventually gets defeated. You know, Jesus does the judgment and then eternity is ushered. So this is the Satan. This is the period of time Satan is released. And it is the one that makes the most sense. I hope that it makes sense for you because this has been a very, very tricky one to point. The premillennials don't have a good explanation for it. Of course, everybody has an explanation for it, but premillennialism does not have a good explanation for it. There's no reason why after a thousand years of gold and light and peace on earth with Christ, you would release Satan for what? To, to test people again? Like, what's the point? That doesn't make any sense. And the amillennialist position also doesn't have a good explanation because they don't have the distinction they need between, from our perspective on earth, co-ruling with Christ in the sense of being conquerors through Christ, through our martyrdom, through our persecution, through our endurance, and Christ actually ruling his heavenly perspective, which is from the ascension all the way to the seventh trumpet and seventh bowl and seventh seal. Does that make sense? Those are two parallel periods of time, but one of them is slightly shorter, which is our period of time, which is what makes room for Satan to be released. So why is Satan released? Well, to deceive the nations into all-out war against Christ, and this is something we're going to look at in the following sections of the final moments. Okay, so now we're looking at the final moments of the end times events, and we've laid the foundation for a lot of different things. Now I want to touch back on what we just talked about with Satan's release, the battle of Armageddon, and the bowls and things like this. Now in Matthew 24, verse 22, Jesus says, and if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short, meaning there will be some people left alive. Second Thessalonians confirms this as well. I believe it's first Thessalonians uh, where we're being caught up. So there are people that will be left alive, meaning that that is an important marker. So keep that in the back of your mind. Later in Matthew, in verse 37, Jesus says, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage and giving and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware, very key word, until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, a lot of people, especially if you're into Nelson Waters and other futurist people who are all about, you know, like end times prophecy, end times uh, prophecy movies or uh, productions, end times productions. They're all about the Nephilim. Look, I believe there are Nephilim giants, of course. But when Jesus says things will be like the days of Noah, it doesn't mean Nephilim are going to come on the earth. I mean, it might be possible, but that's not the immediate reading. The context is what? For as it was in the days of Noah, when people were enjoying themselves, giving in marriage, living life, having fun, until the flood came upon them. They were unaware. That's the key word. So will it be with the coming of the Son of Man? Meaning when Jesus returns, people will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage and having fun and doing whatever they're doing. Well, how... Do you reconcile that with all of the deception and the mark of the beast and yada, 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 all the stuff that we've been presenting? Well, you reconcile it because they've taken the mark. Do you get it? The people who have taken the mark will be eating and drinking and celebrating and doing whatever because they have been part of this system and they'll be completely unaware of the actual return of Christ and the signs that he warned us about. This is why in Revelation 16... Uh, and 15, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. This idea of a thief is about surprising the wicked. It's not what the dispensationalists tell you, that he could come any moment. He could, it's, it could be tomorrow. You never know. Well, no, there are signs that God has given us. Of course, we don't know the exact date and time, but he's given us plenty of signs to discern the truth. Even Paul, when he was writing to the Thessalonians, trying to combat 
the people of his time that were forging letters and saying, look, God is coming or he's already come in the past or he's going to come tomorrow. He's saying, listen, there are signs that need to happen. The man, the man of lawlessness needs to be revealed. That hasn't happened yet. Don't let people deceive you. Well, if Paul says that, then why do dispensationalists kind of cons consistently try to predict the Lord's return or say that it's imminent? It could be like a thief in the night tomorrow. It's, that's not what this is talking about. A thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse uh, chapter 5, verse 2 through 5, talks about people being, the, the wicked being caught like, like a thief in the night. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Okay, great. People usually stop reading after that verse. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a woman, pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Why are they saying there's peace and security? Because they took the mark. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not children of the darkness. So the children of the darkness, the wicked people who are going to sell their souls to the devil, basically, are going to be surprised because they don't expect it. They're not reading the Bible. They're not aware of what the Bible warns. So the day will surprise them like a thief in the night. It won't surprise you and me. Of course, I don't think anybody can fully prepare for the return of Christ mentally, just the heavens opening and lightning flashing. I think that's going to be insane. There's nothing like it's ever happened like that in history. However, it, it, it's not going to be a moment of despair or surprise for you. It's going to be a moment of rejoicing, especially if you really study and show yourself approved and you understand all these things that I'm talking about today. It's going to be a moment of great rejoicing. There's nothing to be afraid of. But nonetheless, it will surprise the wicked as, as, a, as a thief in the night because they're not going to be expecting it. Now, once we clearly see how they're going to enforce the mark... And I've talked about this in my Sabbath series, which is, again, Sunday rest, not Sunday worship, because you can worship God on any day of the week. It's going to be Sunday rest. It'll be resting on Sunday. This is what they want to do. This is what authenticates. Well, it doesn't authenticate anything, but this is what will give glory to Satan as the provider, the creator, the redeemer. It's resting on that day and not resting on the seventh day. Either way, once that happens, we know that the first bowl will start going out. Revelation 2, 16, verse 2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and the harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worship its image. Then you see these other plagues. We'll read through them in a second, but the point is that the first bowl is with the people that had to the mark. There's going to be a lot of supernatural signs similar to Egypt and the plagues that happened once the mark is enforced. For example, verse 3, the angel poured out his bull, the third angel, the second angel poured out his bull into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bull into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became like blood. And I heard the angel in the charge of the water say, just, just are you, O holy one, who is and was and for you, brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them to blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. So it doesn't say that the bulls lead people to more conversions. Do you get the point? There's no more elect to be saved at this point. That's a very important point. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed God of the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. So notice that the sores in the first bowl are overlapped by the darkness. So the sores didn't go away meaning all of this is happening in relatively rapid succession. It doesn't say how long. I don't think that's necessarily important, but I think that the time frame is going to be very short. We'll look at a thing about that in just a second. Now, verse 12 says, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Which, by the way, all this propaganda on YouTube and TikTok about the Euphrates drying up and the four angels being released... This is nonsense. It's not 
I mean, who knows what they're doing? I wouldn't put it past them to do something where they're affecting the river Euphrates. But if you're trying to tie it to the bull judgments, you have to go in sequence, folks. These things happen the moment the mark of the beast is starting to be enforced, and there's no more elect to be saved. But anyway, and I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. This is with the sixth bull. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole earth to assemble them for the battle on the great day of God the Almighty. So the sixth bull is designed to basically release these demonic spirits to deceive people into a particular purpose, which is a great battle, the battle of Armageddon, where people will actually fight against the return of Christ, which is a fascinating thing to think about. So we need to watch for these supernatural signs that I just listed off once the mark is enforced. Again, the mark is the linchpin of all of this. Christians today are watching eclipses and devil comets and, you know, various plagues that are happening. But look, these, God will use it for the good to convict the people who do not have awareness into maybe thinking that oh, maybe we are in the end times. But from a more sophisticated, mature spiritual perspective, these are not listed in the Bible. Do not over-sensationalize and over-spiritualize everything that happens under the sun. The eclipse that's happening as of the time of this video in the future is not prophesied in the Bible. Okay, there are astronomical signs with the sun, but this is not prophetic. Okay, the devil comet that recently came, that's not prophetic. These are not prophetic signs. So you have to watch it in your own evaluation of things that you see and in other people saying, look, this is Bible prophecy. It's not Bible prophecy unless it says it in the Bible. And if it does, you have to double check because their interpretation may be uh, very off. What is significant is when the mark will be enforced, i.e. when they start creating anti-Sabbath laws and persecuting people for it. We don't know the time frame of these particular judgments, the bold judgments, I mean, but they will be swift. For example, in other previous prophecies, like with the seals and the trumpets, um, there are time prophecies like five months for the whatever the locust men, which again, they're, they're not alien locusts from the bottomless pit. Those are symbols of the Turkish army. I go into that in my episode on the trumpets. But there's a timestamp there, and that's five months. But if it's giving you a timestamp, it means that this is a historically fulfilled prophecy, which was fulfilled 150 years where the, the Turks basically sieged the Byzantine Empire and so on. So there's no timestamp for any of these prophecies, meaning that these are probably going to happen fairly quickly. And as you can see, that the, the same people who experienced the first bull with the sores experienced the darkness. So it's not like this is, you know, generations of people happening. This is all in the same generation. Does that make sense? That's an important clue that the people who had sores um, also experienced the plague of darkness. Now, I want to read to you from a uh, site called JesusAlive.cc. And the question is, how long did the 10 plagues of Egypt last? This is an interesting answer. The Bible does not tell us the answer to this question, and as a result, there are numerous guesses. These range anywhere from about a month to about a year. The Jewish Mishnah says one year. Based on my studies, I am guessing about four to five months. Here is why. We do know several facts for sure. First, the Bible says in Exodus 7 verse 7 that Moses was 80 years old when the 10 plagues started, after he spoke to Pharaoh. After the plagues were done and Pharaoh finally let the Israelites go, they wandered the desert for 40 years. Moses died at the end, at the end of the 40 years at the age of 120. Therefore, if Moses was 80 at the start, wandered for 40 years and died at 120, the plagues had to have ended in under a year. Very interesting. I believe we can narrow this time down to even more by looking at a few other facts. We know the duration of the three of the plagues. The first plague lasted for seven days, the ninth lasted for three days, and the tenth was for just one night, beginning at midnight. While we don't know the length of the other seven plagues, it is my guess that none of them were much longer than these. I don't think they could have withstood them except for a very short period of time. 
for and yeah, they were very intense. It's not like you need months and months to to destroy all your cattle. It was all overnight. For example, I read somewhere that it would only take a few days for a swarm of millions of locusts, which is the eighth plague, to destroy every bit of green vegetation in sight. This being said, if we make the average length of each plague, say, four days, we have a total of 40 days that the plagues lasted, which would be interesting, too, because that would be a biblical number. This is also a biblical number that corresponds to the lengths of other punishments, i.e. 40 years of wandering in the desert. 40 days of rain for Noah's flood and Goliath tormenting Israel for 40 days before God helped David kill him. God gave Nineveh 40 days to repent or be destroyed. So 40 is used very consistently by God in Bible prophecy and judgment situations. So it would it would be very interesting if the plagues in Egypt lasted about 40 days. But why did I read this to you? Well, I read it to you because there are obvious parallels between the plagues of the bold judgments on Babylon and the plagues in Egypt. The plagues in Egypt were a type and anti-type situation. Make sense? In the sense that the plagues in Egypt were painting of the future judgment of this final system, this antichrist system. There's obviously like the the sores, the, the, the blood, the darkness. These things are very reminiscent of the plagues in Egypt. So, because the plagues in Egypt didn't last very long, very likely, you know, 40 days, or more, something like that, but definitely less than a year. Um, these judgments with the bulls will go very quickly as well. Meaning once you see the first judgment, and that's clear that the first bull has dropped and these people are getting sores, and you see like the plague of blood and the, the seas, the darkness, we know that it's coming up. We don't have months, months, maybe max, but weeks, very likely. So that's something to keep in mind. These things are going to be revealed as they come. And so it's a matter of engaging the material and developing a relationship with God's word. And of course, with your surroundings and monitoring current events, but monitoring them the correct way and being aware of what to monitor, which is why I was motivated to create this episode. Now, eventually the sixth bowl is going to drop and those spirits are going to go out and deceive people. And Revelation 16, verse 16, and they assembled them at the place in Hebrew that is called Armageddon. So the sixth bowl drops, these deceiving spirits go out to the kings of the earth and basically motivate them somehow to, you know, fight against Christ for, for however reason that's going to deceive them. It's going to deceive them to do the unthinkable. But nonetheless, this is what happens. And this is Satan's final stand where he's going to deceive people into warring against the return of Christ, and even after all of these plagues. So this is an interesting statement. Remember that 1 Thessalonians 4 says that we'll meet Christ in the air. Now, some believe that this will be to join him and to come back down and be part of the army and just destroy evil with him. Um, you know, that's that's a possibility. Some believe that it's a picture of the bridal party escorting the groom down to earth. So either way you want to look at it, we are meeting him in the air and everybody's coming back down to the earth after judgment has been done and everything's been destroyed so that we enjoy the new creation. Who knows how exactly that part's going to work out, but we are going to meet him in the air. In either case, that cannot be counterfeited, and that's going to happen when the seventh bowl and the seventh trumpet and the seventh seal all happen, which is the return of Christ. Why this is important is because, again, Satan cannot counterfeit meeting Jesus in the air. No matter what happens, remember that. Remember that Jesus will have you met in the air. And of course, all the times that this is spoken about is the angels that are gathering the elect. That's another proof text against uh, dispensationalism and the rapture. It's the angels that are doing the work. So that's something to consider. But another interesting thing is that Jesus will likely return on a Sabbath. I've talked about this in my end times, no, not my end time series, my Sabbath series, practically the same thing at this point, but Sabbath number eight or Sabbath number nine, one of those, but I think it's Sabbath number nine, actually, the Sabbath fulfilled in Christ. I talk about it in that episode. There's a lot of very interesting evidence that this could be the case. Again, I'm not predicting the date. I'm telling you that out of the seven days of the week, he has to come on one of them. That's, that's a limitation of the physical world. 
Now, if you were to pick, which one would you pick? Well, I would pick the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. And there is a lot of very good evidence for that. So what does that mean? Well, that means that as the, we have to watch the mark, as the mark starts getting enforced, we need to start watching what level of persecution, because once they start killing people, okay, well, we know Christ said there's going to be people left alive, so the bull should start any moment now. Once you start seeing the bull judgments, like I just read them to you, go read them for yourself so you get familiar with what they are what to look like. Once you start seeing the bull joints, just know that pretty soon they're not going to last long, a couple months max. And then that means that as you're practicing the Sabbath, that Sabbath is getting it. Each week that passes that you're alive, that you're able to celebrate the Sabbath, it gets even closer and closer and closer and more meaningful. Do you get the point of what to watch and what to care for? This is the sequence of things. So I hope that this will edify you. Now, we have one more part to this, actually two more parts, really one more final part and then a review. But this next final part is how to prepare. Okay, well, what a roller coaster, right? I mean, this is a, it's a crazy time to be alive. It really is. And if you're still here, if you learned all this stuff today, then share it with others. Empower them to learn the truth. Empower them to learn what to watch so that they're not anxious for the wrong things, but rather placing their hope and trust in Christ and not being deceived. My goal with this particular section is not to turn you into a prepper or you know anything like that, because ultimately... God has a plan for each of us. If his plan is for you to live, you will live. If his plan is for you to die, you will die. It doesn't matter because we're all going to be resurrected and we're going to have an eternal life together. My goal with this is really just to be practical, practical suggestions and things to think about as we move forward in the next coming decade. Let's put it that way. If God has blessed you with money and funds, it's not a bad idea to start thinking about how to get out of the big cities. Do not become obsessed with being a survivalist, but just be practical. Start to be a little more self-reliant. Start to learn how to do self-reliant things like maybe growing your own food or having more a natural approach, having a simpler lifestyle, those kind of things. Don't neglect spreading the gospel, spreading the truth, helping to wake up others. Don't isolate yourself like all these monks do in their monasteries that don't help anybody. We are told to be in the world, just not to be of it. Spread the truth, wake people up, empower others to know what is coming so that they too can be saved. And especially those people that are still stuck in the things that I mentioned, like personal growth, the religion, charismatic movement, dispensationalism, atheism, all these threads that the, that the woman will be tying together in herself. We have to help get as many people out of there as possible. We don't know who God has chosen to save, and that's up to God, but we knew, we do know that everybody who God has chosen to save will be saved. That you can count on. And we participate in that plan, and that's the exciting thing. Now, if you work for a big company, or you're like in the medical or educational institutions, anything that's really institutional, you got to realize that these places will be the first to comply with these types of things, just like they did with the jib-jab and with all the mass mandates and everything else. So you have to start, you have a few years. It's not like I'm trying, again, I'm not trying to give you anxiety. I'm just saying, be practical. You have to realize that these institutions will be the first to cave. So start exploring how you can have multiple sources of income, be a little more entrepreneurial, maybe a side hustle, start thinking about just different ways of making money. I'm not saying quit your job tomorrow. I'm just saying prepare, and don't be complacent. Don't just let this wave roll over you because it is coming. And remember what happened with the COVID clown show just a couple years ago. That was a dry run by the dark. And the light, of course, is going to integrate all the lessons from that so they can use their own wave. If you're part of a big church, realize that most churches will go along with the mark. Protestants lost the Reformation at the Council of Trent because of Sunday. That was one of the major reasons that they were refuted and declared heretics. So today people still practice Sunday rest and they don't realize that they're paying homage to Rome. 
Most churches have very poor end times understanding. They're often very lukewarm in their doctrines in general. But even the ones that have good doctrines, like, for example, John MacArthur. John MacArthur has some very good things to say as far as Reformed theology, if you know what that means. Basically, just talking about a particular set of views when it comes to salvation. However, John McCarthy is very wrong on a lot of other things, specifically dispensationalism and Sunday keeping. So this is the problem, folks. Everybody has some good to offer you, but nobody's really walking the narrow road. And that's been my goal with this entire thing that I do, is to help you walk the narrow road. Because I've found in my own experience that nobody is walking it in terms of all the doctrines that need to be made sense of. Some people are very good with salvation, but then they veer you off with the end times. Some people might have good end times views, like the Adventists, but then they veer you off with other things like the investigative judgment, which is which is not true. It's a false, ta- it's a false teaching because of, again, they accepted the underpinning that made the sacramental system possible, which is this whole free will salvation thing. But that's another can of worms. Most churches, the point is this, most churches are going to accept the mark because they're a church by default, a denomination is part of the harlot system. So I'm not saying quit your church, but I am saying be very clear why you go. I'm saying talk to your pastor. I'm saying be courageous, share these truths with them, share these truths with other friends at your church and be ready to leave if it comes to that. Because again, we are told by Christ and the apostles, people will betray you, people will be deceived, people will kill you in the name of God. Of course, John 16, verse 2 applies directly to the apostles, but it also applies to us. We're being conformed to Christ's image. Christ was killed in the name of God. They they accused him of blasphemy. They accused him for, you know, doing various things in, against God. Of course, he wasn't, but we're being conformed to that image. Do you think we're going to have any different kind of fate? Of course not. Now, again, some people will be left alive, but whether you're left alive or not doesn't matter. What matters is you endure to the end, you're faithful, you share the truth with others, and you mentally prepare. Dive deeper into scripture, practice the Sabbath, watch my Sabbath series, get edified with that specific series so that you learn the truth and you learn to defend your faith so you can help others, and you learn to defend your faith in case you have to defend it in other ways. Maybe they might have tribunals. Who knows? They called the apostles in front of councils before they persecuted them. So that may be the case. We don't know yet, but when the time comes, the Holy Spirit will help us. Remember that the end times are continually getting worse and worse, even though for those who are wicked, it'll seem like they're getting better. A good model for this is from two places. Daniel 3 verses 16 through 18 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar asked them, is it true that you're not bowing down to the image? And they say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered this and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What is this about? Well, they're saying, look, God is completely able to deliver us. And even if he's chosen not to, we are not going to bow down to your false system. This right here is what you need to take to heart. God has a plan for everybody. I don't know what that plan is. You don't know what that plan is. But nonetheless, we know that God is able to deliver us and sustain us. And if he's chosen not to, then realize that it's for the good. It will be for the highest glory of God. And that doesn't mean that he's forsaken anybody. It means that that is the plan for your life. Not everybody's going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if my family's going to make it. I don't know if you're going to make it. It doesn't matter. Because in Romans 14, verse 8, Paul says, For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We are the Lord's whether we live or we die. As time time moves on, there's going to be more confusion. 
more false converts, more false teachings, false teachers, false prophets, false signs and wonders. All of these things are designed to confuse you so that you don't understand the information I just presented to you in this particular episode. Nevertheless, God has given you what to watch. Use God's word and study history so you see how these things are fulfilled. Study the end times prophetic timeline that I created, the visual, so you can see for yourself visually what's the order of things. Review this episode. Bookmark it. Review it so you understand what do you need to be watching as time moves forward because we don't have a lot of time. Ten years or less. But nonetheless... Do not get distracted by false narratives. Do not get distracted by the Jews, the globalists, the BlackRock, AI, transhumanism. Don't get distracted, but these are just false signs and wonders. The real thing to watch is the Sunday legislation and the going out of this false Christian new system, which is really the old system, to the rest of the world. The enforcement of the law the world coming under one calendar where Sunday is the first day, the enforcement of anti-Sabbath laws, all these things need to be watched for. And then once those things are watched for and you see that they get really intense, i.e. people start getting imprisoned and killed, then you know that the next thing to come very swiftly is the first bull. Because the bull judgments, we have to leave people alive. That's what Jesus said. So you see... He didn't give you exact time frames, and yet he gave you enough information to where if you're watchful, as he's commanded many times, you can discern the season of his return. It's truly profound. Once the bold judgments drop, you know we don't have too much longer. Two months, three months, maybe, I don't know, less than that. But either way, look up, especially every Sabbath, look up. God will provide, and he will endure you, if he needs to, if you are going to be left alive, he will provide for you and he'll give you strength just like, he, just like he fed Elijah with the ravens. If you are meant to die, then he will give you the strength to endure and to glorify God through your death. Just like all of the apostles who rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. I know it's scary. It's scary to me too, believe me. I don't know what God has in store for me or my family or the people I know. But nonetheless, just take it one day at a time. There's nothing to be afraid of. God will give you the strength because he's God and there is no other God besides him. Don't get attached to anything. All of this is going to be destroyed in a very short time. It really will. It doesn't mean, you know, be depressed. It just means don't get attached. Don't, don't make plans 50 years from now. The world's not going to be around. I mean, it will be, but it's not going to be the same world. Don't make plans 50 years from now. None of the things we're doing today are meaningful for eternity. It will all come to an end and we will have a completely different life. The true life is on the horizon. All of this that you've gone through, all of this that you've gone through, that you've experienced, all the pain, all the suffering, all the memories, all the disappointments, it's just been a dry run. This is going to be a thing of the past. You're going to look back and you won't even remember it. It's going to be a totally crazy change of our reality when Jesus returns. Now, they are obsessed with this Agenda 2030 thing. And in 2031 will be 2,000 years anniversary since Jesus was crucified. So I think that that is an interesting thing. I'm not saying Jesus will return in 2031. I think that by 2031, it would be a poetic thing because it's exactly 2,000 years. And certainly the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan that he's going to return in two days, a day with the Lord is a thousand years. Now, of course, all those things are poetic. So who knows? But nonetheless, look at look around you. Look around you. Look at the speed that the way things are happening. Look at the fact that they're pushing for this Agenda 2030, which will happen. The New World Order will happen. It's not going to be a 2030 communist dystopia. It's going to be a 2030 mystery Babylon, you know, neo-Christian nationalist system. But if that's the case, you know, that, that aligns very nicely with everything we've talked about. If they start killing people in 2030, because now they can start imprisoning people and everything else for the mark of the beast, and the bull judgments happen, well... That aligns with 2031, right? 
I am not saying Jesus will show up in 2031. I think it's very likely because of the numeric significance, but I don't base my life on that. I base my beliefs on what I see and how it matches the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't say the year, but it does say the season. And I think given everything, we can discern the season. So stay strong and remember that all these things will come to pass because God has ordained them and don't be worried. So now let's go to a little review of all the parts. All right, well, welcome to this final part. This is really just a quick review of everything. If you're still here after watching everything consecutively, Fennec Fox point for you because you are very dedicated and you will help others learn the truth. If you skipped here, make sure you watch the previous sections. Do it, divide it in parts as you need to because it's very important information. Like I said, this is probably one of the most important episodes that I will ever publish in my lifetime, but we'll see. Now, again, this is just really quick, so go back and review those things and, and use the resources I provided, like in my end time series and other content, to supplement your understanding. I'm also, if you have questions, feel free to email me, tutor at danceoflife.com. I'm happy to help engage you and to point you in the right direction. In part one, we talked about placing the current generation, which is basically we looked at all the different historical proofs of the prophecies. I have an end time prophetic timeline that you can download on my Bible study section on my website. Go to end times and then you'll see if you scroll down there. Um, that is a visual way to see that we are really in the end of the end. We don't have that much time left. I don't know when Jesus will return, but I don't give it more than 10 years. I really don't. And we talked about why that is the case with, for example, part two, and part three were the beasts of Revelation, like the image of the beast, the, the first beast, the second beast. All of these things have come to pass. The image of the beast is almost done. And that was going to give a stage for the kings of the earth to give their power to the woman. And that will be when this mark of the beast will be really enforced on the penalty of not buying or selling. And obviously, you know, people being punished with prison time or death. Now, in part four, we talked about Zionism and the Third Temple, which is really, it's an interesting thread, but it's one thread among many. But nonetheless, everybody's attention is on the Middle East. And we looked at the possible avenues of that where they're going, they're obviously committed to building this temple. There's obviously a false Jewish Messiah rising, like the Yanaka. I forget his name. I think it's like uh, something, Ben Joseph or something, but anyway. Um, the guy's, it's a Yannicka. Yannicka is not his name. It's, it's a title of a prodigy. So the Yannicka, you can look him up online. All the watchmen and dispensationalists are all about him. But anyway, he is coming up. Obviously they're prepping for that. There's a lot of signs and wonders that they're seeing. Like I covered in my Zionist episode at some point recently where they, they saw the white rainbow. So that's a sign for the Messiah. Then there's tribulation and you know, the war in the Middle East, that's a sign the Messiah is coming. So they're, they're prepping this narrative for the third temple to be rebuilt. And the question is, how far will they go with it? Are they going to go as far as counterfeiting the battle of Armageddon and the return of Christ? Are they going to use it as a dialectic to use holograms and create a mass charismatic revival in Islam and Israel? Are they going to just use it for political purpose to create like a dialectic of conflict and then bring people to a world peace situation. We really don't know. That's something to watch, but it's not something to necessarily be obsessed with because again, the future is not Jewish. The future is not communist. The future is not Islam. The future is counterfeit Christian. And so this is the point to get, but nonetheless, that's an interesting thread to watch. Now in part five, we look at how all these threads are being integrated. Zionism, Islam, communism, leftist, you know, ideology, world religions, climate change, new age, personal growth. We looked at all of those as how they're being um, integrated. Zionism and Islam are kind of codependent because they're in conflict with another and they're going to be abolished through 
the various dialectics that I've talked about in that section. Communism is designed to make Catholicism look good, and that's being happening through the political shifts throughout the world, from dark to light, left to right. World religions, through all the councils and ecumenism and things, that one's easy. They, all the churches already worship on Sunday anyway. So that's going to be very easily integrated. The Protestants are practically already back to the Catholic Church already. In 1999, the Lutherans signed a joint declaration uh, with the Catholics on justification, if you can believe that. I forget when, but there's another document called Evangelicals and Catholics Together. You have the charismatic movement in the Catholics, you know, that originated with the Catholics as well. There's a lot of threads that they're bringing the Protestants back. That's not going to be hard. Climate change is another one that's bringing all the secular people to rest on Sunday. New Age personal growth movement through all the pop culture Christianity stuff is all fusing into one worldly Christian, NAR, charismatic, seven mountain mandate, prosperity gospel type of situation. All of those things should be monitored to realize, okay, what is the pay? How close are we to this image being built? And then once the image is done, it's very clear that everybody's joining this thing. The next thing to watch is the Sunday laws, and the progression of Sunday laws. So by the way, send me articles. If you find things as we go on in time about Sunday legislation, you know, keeping Sunday, whatever. Right now, the propaganda is more to get people to to think about keeping Sunday. Oh, it's a good thing. You know, you should rest. We've been so, the, the bad cop has made us work so hard. We should, you know, do what the good cop says and rest. Eventually, they're going to push a little harder on that and, and make the propaganda more. But nonetheless, send me articles if you find them. Um, we looked at climate change, new age, personal growth, yada, yada. All these things are going to be integrated. So that's part five. Part six, we looked at whether or not there will be a counterfeit return of Jesus. And I'm not going to get too much into it because that, that's very well documented in that part. But the idea is that there, there is evidence that this might be the case, especially with what's happening in the Middle East with the Third Temple, because they're fulfilling their false prophecy. Well, if you're going to go all the way, then you have to fulfill the fact that Jesus has to come back and inaugurate a millennial kingdom. You get the point? That's, that's the fullest fulfillment of that false prophecy. And if that's the case... How is that going to work with, I don't know, with everything else the prophecy tells us? So I am not leaning towards that. I think it's certainly possible. Absolutely. But it's not my first guess. I think that they will use maybe false signs like holograms and deception. Who knows? That's very likely as well. And I think that they'll also use this dialectic to bring about world peace. But the Jews and Muslims have to convert somehow. The future is Christian nationalist. The Muslims are not going to give their power to the woman. Neither are the Jews. They have to be integrated in this thing. The question is, how are they going to do that? There has to be some sort of charismatic revival that's sweeping these cultures and shifts them from dark to light. We talked about with Islam, how they have Mary and the Abrahamic family house and ecumenism and yada, 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 and so on. But how it's actually going to play out will be interesting to see. But nonetheless, it will play out. Zionism and Islam are opposing dualities that they're going to use to create a conflict that will generate a, a false sign, supernatural, spiritual alchemy change in those populations to accepting the charismatic New Age Christian thing that's basically going around throughout the whole world. So that'll be something to watch. But whether if that involves a false Christ or not, I don't know. That's That'll be something to have your Fennec Fox ears open for, because ultimately, we, we just don't know. I, I don't, I'm not leaning towards that. But if it happens, you need to be prepared mentally so that it doesn't phase you. Because if the if the news starts showing you, you know, oh my gosh, there's a YouTube video, look, Jesus is appearing and there's lightning, then you can, all eyes are seeing him on YouTube. Well, no, all eyes are seeing him because the earth is a plane and Jesus is coming from above. That's why all eyes are seeing him. Not because he's going to be on YouTube or, you know, the internet or TikTok and there's going to be all these false signs and wonders. So you need to realize that if that, that is a possibility. I'm just saying, if it happens, a lot of people are going to be deceived. So I hope you're not one of them. Now, the next part we talked about Satan's release. And that's just a very interesting detail that I finally 
have seen clearly on. I was really struggling with that, especially as somebody who does believe the millennium is spiritual in nature. But the solution was to see that the the description of the thousand-year period by John in Revelation 20 is not talking about Christ ruling. It is talking about believers ruling with Christ. That means that there is two that there are two parallel periods of time. The one talked about in Revelation 20 is the period from the believer's perspective on earth, those from who got beheaded all the way to the mark of the beast. When there's no more elect to be sealed, that period of time is actually shorter than the period of time that Christ is ruling from the ascension, which was slightly before Pentecost, all the way to the seventh bowl, seventh trumpet, seventh seal, when he returns to destroy everything and save people and basically inaugurate eternity. Christ ruling is actually longer than the period of time where the believers are ruling with him uh, for the thousand years. Does that make sense? And of course, we have a little graph. Let's see if I can pull it out. So this is the this is the chart, and I will put that in my end time series. I'll put this in the on the page for the end time series because I'm going to add this episode to my end time series. That's kind of like the final. I'm not adding any more. I swear, I'm not adding any more because I've added. I'm up to like 35, I think, right now. So I I want to just leave it at that. I think this will be a nice little capstone on the end, of course, of the series. So. If we look at, where is this at? If we look at this closer, you can see two parallel systems. This is the millennial saints ruling with Christ because they're going from when they were persecuted to the final persecution, which is the mark of the beast. But Christ is ruling a little bit longer than that through the bull judgments. The bull happens at the first, the first bull happens when the mark of the beast is being enforced. To, to, because people need to be left alive, meaning Satan is released in between that period. Now, of course, specifically, Satan is released on the sixth bowl to deceive people, to gathering them, to fighting against Christ. How that's going to work, that people would believe such a thing, is crazy. Maybe they might pull out the UFO agenda, but I don't really believe that. I'm skeptical of that because I'm like, really? You're going to confuse the return of Christ with the UFO? I don't think that because it's very obvious. Like Christ will be on a white horse. There's going to be, you know, thousands of people with him. I don't know. It's, it's, it's very interesting how that'll work. But nonetheless, this is Satan's final stand. And that happens shortly before the return of Christ and right after the sixth bowl. So it's really like right here in this little sliver. So it's a very short while. Because again, the point of his bounding was so that he wouldn't deceive the nations into outright war against Christ. He's spiritually prevented from doing that for this entire period of time. He's very active. He's deceiving people in many ways. But he's not able to deceive people into such a particular act until the very end. He's allowed to do that. And those people will be destroyed. And that's the point. So that's Satan's release and... In part eight, we talked about the final moments. We looked at how the timing of these various bold judgments happen, what to expect, how to watch things again. Mark of the Beast is the thing to watch. Once that is kind of really fulfilled, then you watch for the bold judgments. And once they happen all the way through, like once you see the fifth judgment with the plague of, I forget which one's the fifth. Um, anyway, there's darkness, there's sores, there's blood. But the sixth one is the deception, where people are being rallied against the return of Christ. All that stuff is going to happen in a very short period of time. Probably, <clears throat> if it's going to mirror Egypt, let's say Egypt was 40 days, so you're not looking at more than a month or two for the bull judgments. Really not. Meaning, once the first bull drops, every Sabbath that you celebrate is going to be exceedingly important exceedingly exciting. This could be it, man. This could be it. What a thought. What a thought. And so ultimately, it gives us hope, even in our darkest hour. Now, the last part of this was how to prepare. And again, this is more about being practical. Don't be anxious. Don't get to the point where preparation becomes an idol and you're fearing having a bunker and making sure you're stocked all the way and all stuff. Like, okay, some of that stuff is important. If you have the resources, use them. 
be responsible. Start preparing to be more self-sufficient. But if you don't, then that's okay. God is going to provide for you. He will provide for you just like he has provided every single day of your life. And if we are to suffer, he will give you endurance. If you are to die, he will give you courage. If you are to live until the end, he will provide for you and protect you. So ultimately, it doesn't matter whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And that is something to take heart. So be practical. Realize that if you're part of a church, churches will go with the mark of the beast very quickly. That's not going to be hard at all. Most churches are very deceived on end times events, so talk to your pastor, share these things with them, let them learn the truth so they can guide their congregations. Otherwise, be prepared to leave. I'm not saying to quit your church now, I'm just saying realize that denominationalism is a mark, not the mark of the beast, but it's a thing of the harlot. The harlot will get all her daughters back at the end of time. Even non-denominational churches are very lukewarm in their theology, so they'll be very easily integrated. Not necessarily through denomination, but through other things like Sunday keeping, charismatic, revivals, music, yada, yada, all that stuff. If you're part of an institution like the medical industry or the health industry or the education industry, any industry, you need to realize that those will also be first to comply. So start thinking about how to make other forms of income. There's a lot of ways to do that these days, to diversify your income, to have some passive income, to have various you know, ways that you can rely on, or I should say have options, rather than just being stuck to this institutional job where now you'll have to choose between your livelihood and your spiritual health and your salvation. So ultimately, just be aware, just start thinking about these things. They're not an issue right now. They really aren't. The propaganda is ramping up to get people to think a certain way about Sunday, to flip everything politically from dark to light, to, you know, get people to start accepting resting on Sunday, to start Christianizing culture. The propaganda is ramping up, but we're not at the point where you need to worry about quitting your job. However, you don't want to wait there. You don't want to wait until that point until that happens. You want to start being mature and prepared, and at the very least, be mentally and spiritually prepared so that you can deal with what's coming. And again, it's not you that's dealing with what's coming. It is the Lord. He is with us. Remember also that wherever two or more are gathered, there he is. Build relationships with people, stay in touch, build communities. Fellowship can be with just another person. You don't have to be associated to a denomination. Again, I'm not telling you to quit your church. I'm just telling you to be practical, to realize what's coming, and to cling to the Lord. So stay sharp. Stay strong, have faith. Remember that God is going to be with you until the very end. Whatever that end happens to be, it doesn't matter. God is going to be with you. 